thanks for the organizer to organize this first school uh, on the NLB here in Athens. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here. And today I'm going to be talking about the structure prediction in NLP. So let me let me introduce you that. So we're going to work with supervised uh, machine learning, and uh, so the focus is on structure predictions, right? So yesterday your the lecture was on on classification on, on machine learning. So in in, such, in supervised learning we're given pairs of input output uh, points x and y, and we want uh, to learn a function a predictor that given an input point predicts uh, the, the output y. Okay, and we want a function that works well for a scene input s. Okay, where works well is uh, you know it's it, there can be formal ways to, to define that, but uh, we want that generalization, right? So yesterday in the talk, uh, it was about uh, non structure prediction, meaning that the outputs y, what you're producing, are just binary predictions, namely plus one or minus one, or maybe multi-class predictions, okay? You are predicting one label out of a set of uh, labels that are atomic, that they cannot be decomposed. So the lecture today is about structure prediction. So we call structure prediction whenever the output uh, values are structures. For example, they are sequences or they are trees, right? So whenever we want to predict a structure in the output, we call that a structure prediction. Normally, in that case, the inputs are also structured, okay? But what makes a structure prediction uh, uh, the definition is the output one, okay? So let me give you some examples. In NLP, almost everything, uh, uh, in language, almost everything is represented in the form of a structure. Here's a, pro here's a, a, a very common uh, problem, the identity recognition. The input is a sentence X, to about 300 shares of Agri Corporation in 2006. And the output is also a sequence that represents somehow the entities that are mentioned in this sentence. Okay, so and then so in order to represent that, we're gonna have a sequence that for each word it has a label. And the label tells us whether there is an entity or not, and if there is one, which kind of entity. So it's telling that Jim is a person name, it's telling that 300 is a quantity, it's telling that Army Corporation is an organization, and it's telling that uh, 26 is a type expression, right? Uh, so you might, you might think that, well, uh, you're telling me that you want to predict the structure, but actually, and yes, it, it's a sequence, but actually here, for each word, there is one label that I need to predict, right? So for Jim, I need to predict whether it's a person or not, or some other label. So uh, probably most of you have the intuition that you're telling me that you want to predict the sequence, but what you want to predict, there's actually, I'm not seeing this as predicting the sequence, I'm seeing this as many classification tasks, one for each word, right? So if you think about that, it's just a multi-class prediction, and that intuition is mostly correct. It's, it's a correct intuition. We're going to go that way. Uh, but when we call it a uh, structure prediction, is because somehow we believe that predicting the output sequence all at once has benefits. And why? Because we believe that the output labels obviously depend on the input, but they also depend on the output as well. So the fact that um, the two labels or organization are next to each other, it's not a coincidence, right? The fact that this is an organization enforces that this is also an organization name, right? So somehow in structure prediction, we, like, we want to take advantage of the, real, the, the dependencies between patterns in the input and the output labels, but also the dependencies between uh, labels in the output. So let me show you uh, more examples. So here we have ambiguous uh, words like London. Typically, London is a is a location, a city, but in this context, London is a person because it's the last name of Jack London. So Jack London went to Paris, right? So here there are several clues for which we know that London is not a location, but it's a it's it's a, it's a person. Uh, just looking at the input, we see that if the next word is went, okay, it's unlikely that the city goes somewhere. So it, it's unlikely that. Yeah, so it, it, it's it, that uh, the, the fact that we have when here enforces the, the the fact that this is a person name. But if we knew, if we predict these two labels altogether, we will be also enforcing because if 
uh, London is following uh, a, a person name, it, this is likely to be a person name, right? Here's uh, the opposite side, so any word in a certain context can change the, the can, can change its, its role, right? So, and then uh, we also would like to be, uh, to generalize, and so if we see words that are similar to each other, uh, list on here examples. Even we, if we've never seen words like that, we we'll also uh, would like to be able to generalize and predict the correct label. So structure prediction is about learning functions that can represent both patterns of the input, such that this this word here is similar to Jack. So there must be some features that tell me that these things are person names. Uh, uh, surrounding words of the input, but also importantly, we want to take advantage of patterns of the output sequence we're predicting to help the prediction of each of the labels. So this is name entity recognition. Uh, there's many problems, as I said, that can be framed like that. Uh, part of it, pitch tagging is another one. I believe that the lab sessions today are about this problem. So again, place is an ambiguous word. It can be both a verb or a noun. Uh, a play or, 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 or the place, right? So in this context, because place appears in the middle of nouns, it's very likely that it's a verb, right? So again, the, the simplest way to explain that this is a verb is by looking at the surrounding labels. So if we frame this as a pure classification problem, one per label, then we cannot, we cannot predict these labels all at once. While if we do, if we do predict all these labels all at once somehow, then we might take advantage of this kind of patterns, right? Some, uh, something in the middle of two nouns is likely to be a verb more than a noun. Uh, here's another, those were about sequence prediction, uh, a structure prediction generalized to any kind of output structure. Uh, so this is uh, syntactic dependency parsing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be talking about a little bit about that uh, at the end of the lecture. So here the input is a sentence and the output is a syntactic dependency trees. Okay, so we need to, we want a, a prediction that kind of uh, predicts all these, tr all these uh, three, all the edges in the tree all together, right? So while before sequence prediction, it was kind of easy to map it to a multi class problem, one per word, here it's less straightforward how to map this to a straight classification problem, right? So we need somehow to understand how we can predict the structure. Here's another, uh, machine translation is another uh, task, uh, very common and important, that can also be framed as a structure prediction. It's also sequence prediction in the sense that we're given one sequence, which is a sentence in one language, and we're predicting another sequence, which is a sentence in another language. But unlike uh, the first tasks that I showed, where, the, where there was one label per word, here, what is called the, there is not a clear alignment, right? We, so classification is uh, linked to classification, but they don't appear in the same place. So it's not predicting one, one label for each word, it's something else, right? But still, so this is a, a this, this property, the fact that there's not alignment between, there's not a straightforward alignment between the output and the input makes it a lot more challenging. And there is a lecture on that. Uh, I think it's uh, on Tuesday, uh, Monday, Tuesday. Yeah, so you'll get to that. Uh, and outside NLP, we also have plenty uh, object detection. The input is an image, and the output is a grid that for, it, for every cell in the grid, it tells whether the type of object that, uh, that, that is in there. Now, if we frame this as a pure classification problem, we might go and try to classify each of the cells. Right, so, I mean, th so this is a wall, and this is a door, and uh, this is a tree. But the fact that if we kind of frame it as a structure prediction, we, we kind of, what we want is to predict all the, all the values at once. So it's going to be very useful if we kind of know that this is a wall, uh, it's going to be very useful to know that, you know, adjacent cells are also a wall. So the, knowing the label of the, of the neighbors helps you a lot at predicting each of the, of the cells, right? So whenever we want to frame it like that, we, because we strongly believe that the representation should take into account surrounding, uh, surrounding labels or other parts of the structure, we should frame our problem as a structure prediction. So uh, the goals for today is yesterday you saw a talk on, uh, on basic uh, classification and machine learning. So today we're going to introduce the basic concepts when we want to move that to structure prediction. I'm going to focus almost all the time on, on sequence prediction uh, because that's just the simplest problem uh, in this family of, of techniques. 
but at the end of the lecture, I will give uh, an over a quick overview on dependency parsing. Then, what I uh, so one of the main points. So, if yesterday you saw all these techniques, uh, what can can we borrow for from all of that? From the fact that there's uh, a theory and a number of algorithms for learning binary classification. Now, in the real world, we don't see much tasks that can be framed as binary classification, but we have all that theory, right? So, can we borrow? Uh, what we learned yesterday for more real-world problems in NLP? And the answer is yes. So the learning paradigms and algorithms, why something generalizes or not, it's exactly the same. But the problem here will be that because we're predicting structures, which are complex objects, there's going to be a computational um, uh, aspect, right? So uh, certain computations, if we do it in a naive way, are going to be very prohibitive, right? So we need to we need to adapt that part of the of the of the of the methods okay so the main topics i'm going to show some trade offs that have to do with representation and computational tractability and i'm going to present two major families of uh, structure prediction methods namely transition based systems and factored models i'm going to focus a lot as i said on the representation uh, of the input output structures in the in the model and the fact that we need to make predictions okay I'm going to review so I'm going to review learning algorithms namely perceptron and CRFs and I'm going to be discussing uh, the losses we use in in structure prediction okay so this is more or less the plan for today and this is the outline um, as I said I'm going to be mostly focusing on sequence prediction so I'm going to and all of this has nothing to do about learning it's just the form of the of the problem and the type of models we're going to see so I think I'm going to spend half of the lecture here so the break will be around here I think and then we're going to talk about learning and then at the end uh, I'm going to review dependency parsing so that's the introduction if there's any question, please interrupt me, maybe now, if there's a question or a comment or, or anything you want to say, uh, please interrupt. It makes the lectures uh, a lot better. It makes also the, the speed and uh, the pace of the things also a lot more better uh, and adapted to you. Um, no questions, no comments? Okay, so let's, let's get started with sequence prediction. Uh, as I said, I'm going to be focusing on, on this task, right? X is a sentence, is a sequence, uh, which is a sentence, and Y is a prediction sequence, the output, and I'm going to be using the assumption that, you know, it's a sequence that for each input uh, word, I have one label, okay? And there's this direct mapping, okay? More complex problems about sequence predictions is where there's, there is not such a one-to-one -one mapping between input words and... Uh, and output uh, inputs and outputs in the sequence. Okay, I'm going to be focusing on that just because it's the simplest. Uh, it's the simplest um, uh, problem uh, under structure prediction, and so uh, x and y are sequences of the same length with this one-to-one -one alignment. Uh, so each of the items, the words, belong to some space of words that doesn't matter each of the labels belongs to a predefined set of labels, okay, which is 1 to L. So there's 3, 5, 10, 100, but that's it, okay? There's a number of labels that is fixed, okay? And so our goal is a supervised, uh, it's framed as a supervised problem, so we're giving training data which has pairs of uh, inputs and the correct output, X and Y, uh, these are input sequence, output sequence, for example, one, two, three, four, up to M. And what we want is to learn a function that can map input sequence to output ones and that works well uh, for any NC inputs, okay? So in the machine learning sense, that it generalizes, okay? So while this is a learning problem, what I'm, I'm going to focus, as I said, uh, for the first part of the lecture, or actually most of the lecture is going to be on that, it's not about learning algorithms, it's about what kind of uh, functions, okay, what is the form the, of our prediction model, what, what kind of... And I'm going to now give a quick overview of four different approaches which hopefully illustrate the trade-off that uh, exists in structure prediction, okay? Uh, well, first of all, we need to understand one very important uh, aspect that the output space is uh, of exponential cardinality, okay? So let's look at that. What is, how can we understand better the, the solution space, which is all output sequences? So I can build a graph like that. So if this is the input, I can put all the possible values for Jack, all the possible values for London, 
of the possible values for when and so on. And so any, any path here is a possible solution, right? So for example, the blue path, which happens to be the one we would say is the correct one, okay, is, as, is an assignment of a person to Jack, person to London, then it moves to nothing. Uh, so in this notation, uh, this means that this is not an entity, okay? So it's the choice is between no entity or a person or a location, right? Uh, so this is not an entity, this is not an entity, and this is the location, right? While the red path is just another possible solution that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense, but it's still a solution, right? So we want a function that out of all, so any possible path here is a possible solution. And we want a function that can identify the correct one given all the possible ones, right? So, but the search space is all of that, right? Now, if the input is of size n, and there's y possible labels, so then um, the, the possible output is y to the end, right? So it's an, an exponential. So which means that uh, there's just no, it's just impossible to enumerate exhaust, exhaustively all possible, all possible outputs, okay, right? While even though the exercises today, I think that one uh, approach of the exercise is precisely enumerate all the solution space by brute force and then pick the best one, okay? So uh, the exercises will illustrate you what you should not do. And actually it's a good thing because you'll quickly see, if you pay a bit, you'll quickly see that there's no chance that if n, if both y or n are, are just, uh, you know, five, six, 10, it grows in a way that it's just, it's just um, impossible. It's exponential, right? So we need a prediction uh, system that can cope with this exponential number of solutions. And the first approach is the one that I already, uh, I already mentioned before, which is, okay, you're still telling me that, you're telling me that uh, this is a, a, a structure prediction that I need to predict the sequence all at once, all that, but just forget about that. What I see here is not the problem of predicting one sequence for an input. I see this as for every word, there's a multi-class classification problem, so forget about anything done. And that's, that's a very valid approach because it's simple and it can go really very far. Okay, so we're gonna frame it as follows. We're gonna see this as so one, two, three, four, five. There's five different, five problems independent of each other. Each of them is a multi-class problem, right? So here's what, where we're gonna write the notation. So the label uh, for position D, okay, D is maybe two, okay, London. Uh, it's like out of all the possible labels L, location, person, or nothing, I need to choose the label that maximizes some score. Okay, this is just framed as a multi-class problem. It's just that there's a multi-class problem for each position, right? So the input, that's the scoring function, okay, that will represent both the input and the candidate output, okay? It represents uh, a position in a sentence, X is the full sentence, T is the position, say London, and L is one candidate label, okay? So we go to location and evaluate uh, how, what's the score of assigning location to this position. And then we go to person and say, what's the score of assigning person to this location and to this, to this uh, position? And then we, uh, we do it for the no label and we pick the label that maximizes the score, okay? This is just multi-class, okay? Um, so, uh, as of the lecture of yesterday, we know how to, how to learn these scoring functions, okay? So for example, we might take a linear model. A linear model just says that the score is a feature representation of the input part, namely a token in the context of a sentence together with a candidate label, a representation of that times uh, a weight vector, okay? So it's just a linear model because the interaction between the weights of the model and the features is just linear, okay? It's just a product, okay? So F is a vector representing the assignment of a candidate label for a certain position, and W is a vector of parameters, and then there's ways to learn that from data, okay? And so what is this good about and what is this bad, bad about? So we said, I said at the beginning that whenever we want to predict uh, we, we, when we want to do structure prediction, it's both important, so we want to predict a uh, person here, it's both important to take into account features of the input, okay, the fact that, so for example, the fact that the word following London is when indicates that it's not a location, that it's a person, right? So the input features are very important. And so, 
here, with this kind of representation of a, of a multi-class problem, I can represent any feature of the input because I have the full input and I have the position. So I can say the next word is when, the previous word is Jack, and this is the second word, or if this is capitalized. So I can capture the current words, surrounding words, capitalization, prefix, suffix, anything that I think is important for this problem. But what can I not capture is the interactions between the import labels because when I'm predicting person, the nearby label is not there, right? Because precisely I said, this is not uh, a sequence classification problem. What is this is a bunch of classification problems. So then if you, if you restrict to that, the other labels are not available, right? So this is okay up to the point that your function, your predictions will only depend on the input. They cannot take uh, into account interactions between output parts, okay? Now, obviously, we're not just working in parallel here. So uh, we probably are going to predict first the first label and then the second one. And then whenever we ask the label for when, actually the previous labels, if we go left to right, are already available. right? So this is a greedy approach to sequence prediction. I'm going to call it uh, transition-based sequence prediction. I'm going to transition-based is just a more general word for this kind of approaches that kind of apply a sequence of decisions Okay, and the point here is that at time t, I not only have what I had before, okay, the current, the word uh, uh, token in a current position and the candidate label, and the, but I also have the previous predictions, okay? So now my representation for this captures the full input x, the position and the candidate label, but also prefixes of the output sequence. So whatever I, whatever I predicted so far, I can use it to predict what's the next, right? So here I could say, uh, whenever I predict London, I know that the previous word is a person, so I can say, well, uh, this is something that is following a person name, okay? Or here I can say uh, that is nothing based on the previous predictions, right? So uh, this is good in terms of representations, okay? Because I'm, this can depend on the previous labels, not on the following labels because they are not predicted yet, okay? So this is good because some interactions are already taken into account. But the problem here is that the prediction, because we're going left to right, uh, the prediction is gonna be approximate. So there's no, so if we make mistakes here, uh, then those mistakes, it's gonna be hard to correct them, right? And also, this, we, we, we can ask questions, why, why should we go left to right and not right to left? So what's the, if we want to impose an order in which we make predictions, is that we can condition on previous decisions, what is the best order I can use for, for making uh, predictions, right? So if we, if we go this kind of approach, we need to uh, understand what is the best way of predicting uh, the different parts of the, of the sequence, okay? So this might be hard. Uh, so another approach, which I'm calling factor sequence prediction, has a different, um, it's related to the previous one, but has a different uh, style. And this is, I have, I have the input here and I have the output, and actually my, my model is going to work on an intermediate representation, which I'm calling the factors, okay? And it's going to be as simple as, okay, so, um, each factor is just two adjacent labels, okay? And I build a factor by just copying the current label and the previous one. So that's gonna be a factor for each word. Each factor has two labels, which are, you know, the label that should go here and the previous one. So, you know, this is just a null label indicating that is the first, and then every factor has the current label and the previous one, the current label and the previous one, okay? So, what I'm going to do here is that I'm, go I'm going to the first approach. I'm doing a multi-class prediction. So for each word, I'm predicting a number of possibilities. But these possibilities now take into account not only the current label, but also the previous one. So at each position, I'm predicting two labels, the current one and the previous one. Okay? Um, and actually, I'm going to write the equation differently. I'm going to say now that, so before I was writing the label for this position is this one, okay? Now, I'm, I'm, this means the whole uh, output sequence, okay? So I'm going to predict the output sequence. So I'm going to search for all possible output sequences in the space of output sequence in the exponential space that maximize some score between the input and the output, 
okay? And, uh, but what I'm going to do is to write that this score is just a sum of scores, namely for each position, one to n, I'm going to uh, produce a score for that position assigning the current label and the previous one, okay? So this thing here is just a factor of the full structure of size two, okay? And it's the, the, the factor at that position, right? So at each position, so, and then I'm going to learn, this is the function I'm going to learn, okay? I'm going to learn a function uh, that given a candidate factor and given a position, it gives me a score. So uh, like multi-class, it's just like predicting something, but I'm not predicting just one label, I'm predicting two, okay? And then uh, by summing these scores, I'm gonna produce a score for a full sequence, right? So note that here, because at each position, I'm predicting the current label and the previous one, if I take one label, say person, this appears in this uh, score, but it also appears in this uh, score. So every label of the output sequence, so this is a candidate output sequence, every position here participates in two scores, right? Uh, the one for the current position and the one for, the for, the, for when the current label is the next one, right? Um, so that's why I'm writing it in this way. But you'll say, wait, but you are maximizing over this set, so Yes, I'm maximizing over this set, so this is searching over all possible sequences, right? So this, in principle, we cannot do, but actually we can. So what, we, what I will show later is that by exploiting this uh, factorization, it's a factor model, this maximization over an exponential number of solutions is actually tractable, okay? So for this kind of model that is factored, uh, I'm gonna be able to recover the sequence that maximizes this uh, score of the sequence, and in addition, my function is going to be able to capture any property that has to do with the full input, because that's available, and not the full output, but parts of the output. And so I'm going to be able to capture interactions between what I put in the factors, okay? So it's an intermediate approach between multi-class and the previous greedy. The previous greedy had access to the full uh, sequence of, the, of previous decisions. Now I have access to nearby uh, labels, okay? And that's the final approach, the fourth, which we're not going to see, but I want to mention, uh, which is re-ranking, okay? So in re-ranking, we're going to have an input, and we're going to consider as candidates all possible output, output sequence, okay? So actually not all of them, but uh, some of them, okay? So I'm going to assume, and then the benefit of that is that my score function here is taking a full input and a full output. So here, there's no restriction. The representation can make use of anything. Mm, there's no restriction. Uh, so this is fully expressive. But the problem is that because there are an exponential number, we cannot solve that. But we can, if instead of dealing with all possible output sequences, we have a way to select the most likely one. So say that I have a base model that can, out of all possible sequences, can discard many of them. And maybe can select a hundred sequences that are likely that uh, look good for them, right? So then I can go and uh, define a model that enumerates explicitly each of these hundred sequences. I'm, going, I'm calling this the active set of, of possible sequences and then having a score, okay? So this is called re-ranking because I have a base model that kind of first ranks all possible sequences in some in some way, maybe I'm using one of the previous methods to select a subset of possible sequences, and then I'm going to select mm, 10, 100, 1,000, okay? And for each of them, I'm going to do a full representation that can look at any feature of the input and the output, okay? So this is uh, fully expressive. So what I mean by this is that there is a trade-off between uh, representation and, and prediction, right? So if we, if we use just label classifiers, our representation can only, of the output part can only look at individual labels alone, okay? And this is the, the prediction, it's trivial, it's, it's exact. In transition-based systems, what I do is do, I have a process that keeps predicting uh, the structure incrementally, let's say left to right, and then in that case, I can use the previous decisions. Okay, but because I'm conditioning on uh, 
on all my history, it's, it's going to be not tractable. Okay? I'm going to uh, have to do greedy prediction and beam search. It's not going to... So it's expressive, but uh, not tractable. It's greedy. While factored models, they can represent parts of the output, and by doing that, it is uh, tractable. While re-ranking, we can use the full output, but it's certainly not tractable unless we limit to an active set. Okay? So there is there's two take-home messages. The first is there, is, there exists a trade-off between uh, the expressivity of the model, namely what part of the output can the model see, uh, and, the, and, the, and the computational aspects when it comes to prediction. Okay? So this expressivity trade-off exists. And uh, the second uh, take-home message is the one that is common in machine learning. There's all these approaches. You should always take the simplest one depending on your task. Okay? So uh, that's not just a universal task in, in NLP or, or machine learning or AI. There's many different tasks. And, um, you know, so maybe if you can, if, if just uh, reducing to multi-class without looking at nearby levels works well, so just do that. Maybe if, if your predictions can be done just looking at the input and one level at a time, the simplest thing you can do is to reduce to multi-class and that's it. Uh, but depending on the problem, you might have to go down the line, right? So actually in NLP we see everything, all the approaches are valid today, uh, and this lecture is about kind of understanding what are the the elements behind here. So, questions? I, I guess I'm not sure what you mean by exact prediction, that you, you, you don't make any errors. I, what, I, what do you mean? Um, exact prediction. It exact means prediction means that it, do, it doesn't mean that uh, there's no errors, okay? It means that I'm recovering the, the sequence that has the maximum score. Okay? This is an important point. So, so here I'm defining, I'm defining a score. Okay, my model, my learning model, the, for any x and y, x is, is, an, is the input, y is a candidate. Okay, it gives this pair of x and y, if I assign y to x, this is a score, 10. And this other y has uh, 100, and this other y has uh, minus 10, right? So what we post the prediction is like, out of all possible sequences, in this case in an active set, okay, but out of all possible candidates, pick the one that has the maximum value. So by exact, it means that my algorithm to solve this is actually picking the right one. By approximate or inexact, I mean that it's picking one solution, but it's not necessarily the one that uh, has the highest score. Okay? That's, an, that's an important point. And that's different from whether uh, the prediction is correct or not. I can, I can have a model that is, is produces exact predictions, but those are have errors, okay, and that is common actually. Okay, so both are possible. Can, can you say why the the transition model doesn't pick the best? Score? So I will. Uh, that's part of the lecture, so I we will see that. That was just an overview. More questions? So uh, specifically, I'm going to focus on now on transition based and factored models. That's going to be the rest of the lecture. Yeah? So I keep going. Okay, so I will extend now uh, greedy sequence prediction, which maybe will answer your, 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 your question. So this is the simplest model I can think of for, for uh, structure prediction, and this belongs to the family of transition-based models. Okay, so transition-based models are those that build the output structure incrementally, right? One, one, one piece at a time. Okay, so if we are just predicting sequences, you know, just like you first predict the label for the first word and then for the second one and then for the first third one and then at each point you need to pick what is the next label okay and because i already predicted labels so i can use that so it's uh, it can be thought as a multi class uh, so my function here okay i have one function that given a, a full sentence and a position it scores a candidate label knowing that i already predicted that for for the previous label, okay? So just one little thing. So here, uh, I'm using the same function for all the positions, okay? That's important. So I'm, I'm learning one function that will always predict what comes next, okay? So I'm just, we're just learning one model here. An alternative could be 
for each position, I have different model. Okay, I'm not focusing on that. Okay, uh, what I want to highlight here is the is the representation, right? So this because it's greedy, and because it's greedy, it takes advantage that I have what I already predicted. Okay, but in any case, from the machine learning perspective, it's just a multi-class model. Okay, it's a multi-class model that is greedy. What so what I want to insist about is. Uh, what is actually this, okay? What's the, what's the representation behind this? What can we represent and what we can't, okay? And then once I have covered that, I will come back to the why this thing can fail, okay? Um, okay, let's go. So this is gonna be a bit, that's gonna be a bit of notation now. Um, so I'm gonna focus with linear models in this lecture uh, all the time. At the end, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain the from linear to nonlinear, but I'm not gonna develop that. That will come in the other lectures of the of the course, uh, nonlinearities and representations. So uh, I want to, for any model that I show, I will kind of highlight what are the features, right? So I need to spend two or three slides, or maybe four, uh, about how we build feature sets. Okay. So let's. Rev so this is mostly what Ryan explained yesterday. Okay. A linear model is a weight vector times a feature vector, but I want to insist on that because now uh, my feature vector is, is encoding. Mm, some point, some position in the input sequence together with the label or whatever we are placing in there, right? So as yesterday, the feature function encodes both the input part and the output part, okay? So here the output will, would be L. L is the label we want to assign here. And this is the input part, X at position T. And this is the context of the predictions, right? Okay, so the you know there's a, a, a vec you can think of a vector of d features okay and then along it there's a weight vector and then the computation the score is just given by the inner product okay so this is, there's a weight here the, for this feature weight and so on and so you multiply each uh, each feature by its weight you sum all of them you get the score right so so the goal, the goal, let's not forget about the goal. The goal is that at position T, I need to guess the correct label, right? So L is a possible label, and this uh, is, is in the context of this, right? So this function is a context of this. So th the, the goal is, let's not forget, let's, let, the goal is to correct, is to predict the right uh, label for this thing, for the, in this context, okay? Uh, and so, mm, you know, what is essential is the construction of the feature vector because then all that there is in the function is a feature vector and a weight vector. A weight vector is learned with data. So the only chance that we have that to get the correct label is that here there's enough information to discriminate between the good candidates and the bad candidates, okay? And why this is challenging? It's challenging because it's not that, so if you read a machine learning book, like uh, an essential one, the feature vectors, or th they already, uh, th it's in the assumptions, right? I assume that X is a feature vector in some mode, okay? So go ahead. But here, this is a sentence, and this is a position, and this is, a, you know, those are, I this is a sequence of words, and this is a sequence of previous predictions. And so it's not that obvious how to put that into a weight vector, right? Sets that, the, so whatever we put here, uh, well, you know, whatever needs to, make this assignment needs to be here somehow, okay? So the new trend for doing that is doing representation learning, okay? Uh, out, uh, so we, we, we extend these models such that the features are also learned. So this is learned and the representation is also learned out of something more basic. So that will be the topic of the following lectures, okay? But in the old school, which is as far as 10 years ago, we uh, construct this manually with what we call feature templates, okay? And Ryan already went uh, over that yesterday, but I'm going to uh, go over that again, okay? So what is a feature template? <coughs> um, so first of all, it, uh, what is a feature, right? A feature is just mm, anything. What's in a feature? It's anything we can compute out of the signature of the function, okay? Out of the, well, f first, let's forget, let's forget about this. Okay, let's forget about this, and let's let's just have features that look at uh, one label in a in a in one position of a sentence. Okay, so uh, anything we can compute using the signature, using the position and the label, 
can be there. And in particular, what we need to place in there are uh, anything that indicates whether the current candidate label is a good label for that position or not. Okay, we need to put things that uh, help us discriminate whether that's a good assignment or not. Okay, so uh, what what we use are indicator features. So an indicator feature is a simple pattern of the input in the and the position and the candidate label. So for example. Uh, feature J, this coordinate here might be encoding whether in the current input, the current word XT is London and the current label is uh, location. So this is like a, a flag, right? So then if in the current input this is the case, then this is set to one, okay? There's a one here and then the, the weight vector will react accordingly. If not, there is a zero, okay? So if there's a zero, this weight is irrelevant, right? So the indicator features are indicators of certain patterns, right? So if we see that the current word is labeled as location, this looks as something likely, right? It's likely that London are locations, right? So our weight vector will have a positive weight. A good weight vector would wa have a positive weight because uh, London tend to be locations. Now, the feature K might be if the next word is went and the label is location, right? So in that, if that patterns occur, there's a flag and gets to one. So position K, if that's the case, there will be a one. And the weight vector might put a very negative weight here. Why? Because it's not a good assignment, okay? So this is a good assignment and this is not a good assignment because uh, words followed by one are not locations, even if they look like that, right? So if our weight vector puts more weight, more ne negative weight here than positive weight, we will assign, we will not assign uh, location to London. Do you get the picture? So we are kind of encoding parts of that, right? So because it's just a bunch of zeros and ones, so what is the chance that the context if this? What is the chance that I have London and location, there's little chance, right? Most words are not London. So mo in most cases, this, uh, this feature, this value will be zero, okay? Which means that indicator features produce very sparse feature vectors. Now, you might be thinking, but it's like, how do you get this? Because you're already, it seems that I have previous knowledge about what works and what doesn't. So do I really need to write one function for each possible word and label, that looks like crazy, right? So how ahead of time, if I'm learning uh, uh, that, how can I know what are the, vo the relevant vocabulary, okay? So we're not doing it like that. So what we, we use are feature templates. So what's a feature template? It's a way of generating these indicator features automatically and at large scale, okay? So a feature template is identified by a type and a number of values, so for example, the feature template for words is taking, is identified by this tuple, by a label and a word, okay? And it defines a function, says that this is an input, right? So it says that if the current word is this one in the template and the current label is A, then it says one, and if not, this is zero. So this is a template. Any pair of word and label that you put here generates one, one, one feature, right? So, um, and so this creates a way of indexing feature and weight vector. So, you know, this is the word template. So if, we ha if I have the word I, you, when, so, John, Mary, London, Paris, I have these words. For each of the labels, I have one feature related to that. So, okay, this, this feature here is capturing whether the current word is John and the current label, uh, the candidate label is, uh, is, is nothing. While this feature here is capturing whether the current word is Mary and this is location, right? And this is capturing whether the current word is Mary and this is assigned as person. So, uh, depending on the word and the candidate label, the, the, fit, the, the function will put a one in one of these, okay? So, this feature template will generate as many dimensions as words and labels are in my problem, right? So in practice, what do we do? We define a feature template and then we instantiate this in the training data, which kind of automatically fills up all this. Okay, and then once we have all the feature vectors defined, which capture every word observed in the data with every possible label in my problem, then I have a parameter vector indexed by the same elements. And then this is a huge feature vector 
most of things are completely irrelevant, like those combinations of locations and, and, uh, and words that has, have nothing to do with our problem, we let the learning algorithm choose which are the relevant ones, okay? So we generate a large number of features and we rely on learning to set up the right ways. Okay, so let's uh, wrap up these more features for name entity recognition, say that I have, I want to represent this kind of thing, uh, Jack London with a label, okay? In practice, what we're gonna do is define feature templates that uh, capture the current word, that's what I saw before, so maybe that creates a chunk of, uh, a chunk of, of dimensions, is, is capturing the current word, is capitalized of digits, I will have another chunk of dimensions capturing that, uh, I will have prefixes and suffixes that can be relevant, I, uh, whether the current word is in some dictionary of known uh, locations, the next word, the previous word, okay? So you can think that, uh, so my representation has different blocks for different properties, okay? Current word, next word, previous word, digits, and so then I'm, I'm combining that with every possible label, so for every label I have this kind of block of features, repeated, all that, and then, uh, the actual features are generated by instantiating on the data, right? So given the data, my f dimensions get uh, initialized. Questions about this? Yes? Can you please move to the previous slide? Previous? Yes. Do you aggregate the instances or is it a count or is it one? or not so nor here aggre yeah. aggregate over what uh, every time you see it in the training set no 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 this is uh, when i say this is just to define what are the dimensions then for a specific instance so let's say this instance yes uh, so in this situation right so say that i'm coding this so in this situation the dimension that would get the one would be a uh, person London, right? So this one, this would get a one. While if I try the location label, this would be zero and this would be one, okay? So these are, are just zero and one. I'm not aggregating anything. There will be an aggregation later, but not now. There was another question. Feature selection, I heard. Is the feature selection done? Uh, I mean, there are two steps. The first one is feature selection, and the other one. So is this is not feature selection. It's, I'm just, I'm just saying this is. We're not selecting features. We are, in, we are just creating the representation space. The, I'm not selecting anything. Uh, Actually, the selection it? will. The, the learning algorithm will do that. If the if the learning algorithm puts a weight a weight of zero along uh, a, along a certain feature, it means that it's not selected. If the if okay. the if the weight is non-zero, then it's selected. So it's just one training uh, phase both for the features and for the labels? Yeah. Okay. okay, let's move on. So uh, what I'm saying here is that I have all these ways to construct feature vectors that look at many different things for one word in the context with one label, okay? What, so the important part here was that a word in context with one label, but the structure prediction is not just about that, right? We want to precisely represent several labels at a time. Okay, so now let me go back to the greedy model. This, this was just a representation for a straight classification. One position, one label, okay? So now let's go to the greedy model. Uh, the feature template not only has access to L, which is the candidate label we are trying to assign, it also has access to the labels we already predicted, right? So uh, the feature templates, can na have now more information. They can encode all that we can encode if we don't have that, plus features about the, l the previous label itself. So I can have a template that captures the current word, the current label, that is L, and the previous label, that is here, right? So uh, the word is this one, the previous label, and the current one. So this indicator says one if the current word is W, and the candidate label is B, and the last label in this sequence of labels is A, okay? So in practice, uh, because we have the full history of decisions, we can capture the preceding labels, not just the, the previous one, but two previous one, and three, and four, and five, and six, but you know, at the end, it, it, can, it has to be predefined. So uh, I cannot, you know, 
uh, if I go very far, my feature templates are going to be very complex, right? So I need ways, and I'm not going to extend this, uh, I need ways to capture a sequence of previous labels into a fixed uh, feature set. So I captured preceding labels, I can capture a, a back of labels. Is this label appearing somewhere in the previous? And I can do combinations with other features, okay? So at some point, whenever you start putting lots of information in these feature templates, it actually becomes a bit complex how to select the combinations, especially the combinations. So uh, we were doing that. Now neural networks automatically do this, okay? Uh, but the question is, the neural network is combining things uh, in, in, a, in an automatic way, but we need to understand what are these things, right? So um, a neural network if it learns a representation, it's not going to be magic. It's going to be a combination of what it has available at that point, right? Okay. So, um, uh, so let me just. Uh, I'm so here's almost all all, all, all I, ha I have to say about greedy models. Uh, greedy models are just an instance of transition system. So it's a more general form. So let me. This slide is just uh, describing this more general form. But uh, so, uh, in general, a transition system is one that builds a structure incrementally, okay? And it does it as follows. So, um, it has a set of, so the, the greedy model is an instance of that. It has a set of states for, for, for an input uh, sequence. So, for the greedy model, the set of states are all the possible partial labelings of our output. So, from you know, the vector of output labels from an empty vector to just one label to two to three to four to five to up to the length of the sentence, right? So it's this, it's this sequence of output labels we are predicting, right? So each, uh, each output sequence, each partial output sequence is a state. So what's the, there's an initial state and a set of final states. So in the greedy model, the initial state is just the empty out to output sequence and the final states are the sequences, uh, the output sequences that are of, of complete length, okay, of the same length as the input. There's a set of allowed actions. So at each state, we have a way to make one more step. So in again, in the greedy model, this is trivial. It's just what uh, the, the set of actions is assigning one of the possible labels to the next. Then the th uh, there's a transition function that given a state and an action produces what's the next state. So again, in the greedy model, if I'm in a certain, if I have a certain prediction and I predict the next label, I just concatenate that and I get a new state, which is a concatenated one. And I have a scoring function that given an input, a state and the action, it produces a score, right? So this is the score function I've been talking about, right? And so the process, how it works is that it starts with the initial state and while the state is not final, Okay, it picks the action out of the possible actions available from that state. It picks the action that maximizes the score function, okay, that has access to the state and the action and the full input, and then it transitions to the next state, okay? From a state, I take action A, and I get to the new state, and I keep looping until I get to a final state, okay? So I start with an empty sequence, and at each point I, I pick what is the label for the next position, uh, given a score function, and then I add that label to my s output sequence until that is final, right? So the point here is that my score function has access to the states and actions, so it has access to the full history of decisions, okay? And so this is uh, simple, conceptually. It's super fast, because it's like greedy, one, one piece at a time, and it's very expressive, because we can encode anything we predict so far. It's really very expressive. So. It's very popular for NLP. I just showed greedy uh, sequence prediction, which is a trivial uh, instantiation of this, one level at a time. Uh, later, if we have time, I'll, 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 I'll review shift-reduced parsing, which is a super popular approach used uh, for many, many models to predict parse trees. Uh, word segmentation machine translation also is usually framed uh, like a transition system somehow. Okay, But there is a problem, is that Greedy predictions are not optimal, and that's that's what uh, what was asked before. Even when we apply uh, strategies like beam search, and and what is that? So here's a 
Because like a greedy system, when it makes a decision, it cannot undo, it cannot backtrack, okay? You might think of backtracking, things like that. Well, greedy, we're not doing that, okay? And sometimes, so we did the wrong decision, and sometimes the model is good enough such that with larger scope, the model was correct. The scoring function somehow was correct, but not at every step in the video. And let me show you an example. So let's say that this is, I saw Paris Jackson playing, okay, and we're here, up to here we're predicting that none of this is, a, is an entity. And now we're asking the model, we're here, we're asking what's the label for Paris? Okay, and, and we try each of them, and, and when our scoring function gives minus five for nothing, it gives 10 for location, because Paris is usually a location, and I saw Paris, right, I saw the city, and it gives only five for person, so it might be, okay. Okay, so you, you take this one. So at that point, you assign location to Paris, okay? And that's it, you are, you are done, you, you, can, you chose this, the right label was that, Okay, and what do I mean by sometimes the model is right at the global scope but not at the eight degree step? It means that it shows this, that, but you know, if now it's, it's stuck because it's like shifting to assigning location to Jackson, it just gives minus five because Jackson is not a location. And then in the, it's like going to now to a person, it gives minus 10. It's like there's no way that two words that are together change from location to, so it's like the model got here and it's stuck in a place that is just not good, right? While if it had taken this path, okay, then it would have gotten 10 points. All this is invented just to point the, the thing, right? But these things happen, right? So the fact that at, at each local decision, you might not see correctly what's going on, right? Uh, and you might make a mistake and then you cannot recover, right? So there's three ways we can, uh, we can do that. The thing is that, well, make your functions better, right? So if my local function is perfect, mm, you, cannot, you cannot beat greedy, okay? So this should not happen, right? So if this happens, it's because the feature representation should look at what's coming later, okay? We should look better at the input, okay? At this point, it cannot look at these labels, but it can look at the input. So somehow make this dependent on that, I don't know, if you saw these kind of patterns here, it cannot be that this is a person, right? So that's one thing. The other thing we can do is beam search, which is uh, I keep with my model, which is not perfect, but I, I assume this, okay? So what if instead of keeping one path, the best one, I keep several? I keep several. So maybe, I, but I cannot keep all of them. I know that all the paths are exponential, okay? But uh, so grid is like, just I just keep, uh, extending the best solution up to a certain point. But what if uh, instead of just the best, I keep the two bests? So if I kept the two best, I would, I would get here, I keep these two, the red and the blue, and then I shift, and then I do, I extend, I extend this path, there's three possibilities, I'll, I extend this path, there's three possibilities, so at this point I have six possibilities because I'm, I'm considering two paths and three possibilities for each, I have three possibilities, I keep the two best, okay? And then the two best will probably have this one and then I keep going, so I keep, I keep the 10 best, I keep the 100 best, okay? So this is called beam search, okay? It's a general uh, local search method, much more general, it's general in AI in general, it's the topic of local search. So it maintains several good hypotheses in just instead of just the best one. Still, it, it will not necessarily pick the best possible global solution, right? It can still get stuck, but the chances are much lower because we are just uh, exploring more, okay? Uh, I'm not explaining being searched because there's actually many strategies, okay? Uh, and sometimes the strategies are specific to the problem and to the transition system. So I prefer that you actually read specific uh, works on, uh, on transition systems and how they do beam search, okay? Because it can be relevant, okay? It can be relevant, but the, the idea is that one. Instead of just maintain one thing, maintain several. And then empirically, it, is, it, it often improves over greedy search, okay? So often, the model is good at the global, but it's not, it can make mistakes. So many mistakes can be corrected just by uh, making a better search, okay? Questions?
ask no questions. OK, so that's all, all I have to say about uh, transition-based systems, I think. Uh, and now, so I said that there were, there were three ways of not having this kind of things, okay? One is make your classifier better, so that it's good at, uh, at local, okay? You cannot be that, you cannot beat that if that exists. The question is like, how do I do that, right? Um, the second is, okay, let's keep with that classifier, but let's just, you know, explore more. Okay, with some local search is not um, guaranteed. We don't have guarantees of anything, uh, but that. And the third is to change the model such that we have a notion of what what uh, of optimality. Okay, such that we have a notion. Okay, and uh, factor models are that. Okay, and as a matter of fact, um, so I already explained before. Okay, there's a sequence X, there's the output sequence Y, and the learning, the scoring, it doesn't, it operates on parts of the, of the output, okay? That's what my score function is modeling. So I'm, all the time when I, I'm speaking about um, factored models, but all my slides about uh, bigram factorization, which means that bigram, it means that I'm taking two labels at a time, okay? And I'm, uh, there are several conventions. In I just use it for simplicity and all that. I'm, I'm doing the convention that at each position, I'm predicting the current label and the previous one, OK? So this can be changed, OK, so to predict the current label and the next one, if you prefer, or predict three labels centered here or there or the other places, OK? So there's some things I need to set. I do it for simplicity. Uh, but this is a more general framework, right? So uh, the as I said, factors are these things, they are parts of my structure, in this case, pairs of adjacent labels that are uh, assigned to some position, okay? That's what my model uh, operates. And then I'm not gonna, I'm, uh, it is very important now that we don't think about uh, how we do predictions, we'll, we'll cover that later, but we just establish what do we want, okay? And what we want is that given an input sequence, I'm, predicting the full output sequence. So now I'm, st I'm starting, uh, I'm defining my model from the very beginning, right? My goal is a structure prediction. I need to predict structures, okay? So I'm given an input sequence, I'm predicting the structure that out of all possible ones, this is an exponential space, but we'll, we'll deal with that later. Out of all possible structures, I want the one that maximizes a score of this label, and I'm going to define this score in a factorized fashion, meaning that of each sequence, I'm enumerating at each position the factors, the bigrams in this case, and for each one, I'm having a score, okay? So I'm, I want the output sequence that maximizes the sum of the scores of the factors it contains, okay? So there's two questions. First is, well, how are you going to do the scoring? of factors, and it's going to be almost very similar to what we already saw. And the other is the interesting question, right? Which is like, okay, yeah, you are defining this criteria. Now we know what is optimal, but there's many exponentially, there's exponentially many uh, possible sequence. How are you going to solve the argmax problem, meaning actually picking the one that maximizes that in, uh, in polynomial time, right? In, in time that is not uh, galactically huge okay so let's start with the first question just to to sort it out okay so this is going to be a very similar game okay uh, for now I'm, I'm playing with linear models and that's going to be a weight vector and that's going to be again a feature vector and the, the, so there's always uh, an input and a certain position fixed now I'm calling this i before I was calling this t the same this is pointing to position and now what I'm having is two labels okay uh, I'm having two labels, uh, and by convention, so if, if i is 2, the two labels are person to person in this case, okay? Uh, so I'm, I'm considering two labels assigned to a certain position, okay? And so I'm not going to develop that, but essentially this feature vector will be a d-dimensional feature vector that encodes a position and this pair of labels, okay? Uh, but for the context, so in a multi-class, we only have one label, we don't have the previous label. 
And in the grid approach, we have the current label and all the previous labels. Now we are only having two. So our features are more expressive than just reduction to multiplots, but are more restricted than grid models, in the sense that they only have access to the previous one, not the full set, okay? Uh, I'm not going to give you examples, you can imagine that. Uh, I'm going to introduce this, this, uh, this aggregation. Before there was a question, uh, a question on aggregation, but this is a different thing. Okay, I'm going to be summing, I'm going to be aggregating vectors, but I'm going to do something maybe a bit surprising at the beginning, but say, I have, I, I can instantiate this at every position of a, of a sequence. Right. And I get for each position, so say I have x, y, it's given. Okay, at every position, I have one feature vector for this one, for this one, for this one. So all the feature vectors, they come, they lie in the same space. So I can sum them. Okay. So I'm going to consider the sum over the feature, given an x, y pair, the sum of the feature vectors I consider across all the positions, across all the factors. Right? Uh, so it's a bit weird, but it's just a mass construction. So for now, let's just say that it's a mass construction. Okay, this we understand, we build it, and now for some reason I sum it. So what does it mean to sum representations of bygrounds of different places? It doesn't make a lot of sense, but we can define it, right? It's an aggregated representation summing bygraph feature vectors across uh, input output pairs, okay? And so if, in case that the dimensions were Boolean, zeros or, or ones, now, the dimensions, if I sum zeros and ones, I'm going to get the counts, okay? So, in this aggregated feature vector, uh, at each dimension is specified with the same template, only that, instead of being an indicator, it is appearing or not, it's saying how many times this pattern is occurring in my input-output, okay? So, the, the, the good thing is that no matter how long these sequences are, this is still a d-dimensional feature vector. Right? So what I'm showing here is a way that I supply this by feature templates. This is a fixed thing, okay? it's capturing just a fixed part of the output. And now, no matter how uh, uh, an input-output sequence pair, the length how it is, this is, a, this is a making a feature vector. That it's just doing a representation. So why it is useful? Because whenever I have a factor model and I'm using linear scores, I can uh, reason like everything is a linear model independently of whether this is structure prediction or something else. Okay, then let me develop that. So I, I define my model to be this, where the, feature, where the features are factor this way. Okay. Now, what I can see, what I can say now is that uh, for any input output, I'm producing a score which is a linear, in the classic sense, uh, with vector times the feature vector of input times the output. I know that uh, my feature vector is a sum over bygraph feature vectors. Because this is linear, I can put the, the W inside, and I can write it as a sum score. Right? So why am I telling this? Because there's these two views of uh, linear factor structure prediction. Okay? One is the one I started. Okay, if you, if you have a, a sequence, you want the output sequence that maximizes the scores over the bygrounds. Okay, but if I, the way we develop this allows me to do this and allows me to come here. Right, so this is going to be telling me that irrespective that X and Y are structures, this is a linear model. Right, so this is not different from multi class. Multi-class models have the same form, right? For each input and each possible output, you have a feature representation and model, right? So it means that whenever I think about how to learn W, it's going to be very useful to think of our model as just a linear model, which is what it is, right? It's a linear model. And uh, the fact that this factor is not necessarily relevant to reason about generalization. Okay, so anything, any theorem that says if this is linearly separable, like the, the perceptron, then the perceptron is going to find a good weight vector with that. So we have a notion of linearity. So if our factor representation makes the data linearly separable, then the perceptron uh, theorems apply 
directly because this is the linear model, right? So the fact that we know that uh, with, that we're using factor representations and linear models, uh, it's useful to say, well, our model is a linear model, but we are not just having one possible y; we're having exponentially many. Okay, and so. Because I have exponentially many, there will be some computations mm -hmm. that we will need to come here to say, here's a fast way of doing that. Okay. So whenever we think about computations, we'd like to come here and say, you know, there's different scores for these different places. Whenever we think about machine learning, we, we, we just want to know we we'll, are we'll just having a linear model. Questions? Yeah? And, and, uh, and I thought that uh, this model was predicting the, the current record in the previous one. No, uh, yeah. No. Now, now you're telling that it no. was this model, this model is a scoring. This is a scoring uh, the current DAC in the previous one. That's what the model is. The model is producing a score for two times at a time. But what I'm predicting here are full structures. It's just that the, the score of a, the score of a y, a full output, it's just the sum of these scores. Okay, so if this is important, so it better be clear. It's not predicting the values at the time for a word. It's using the previous table. <laughs> I'm not saying how yet. So the, the, the question is if the definition is right, it is is not true though. So the model for any for any so don't, don't think about don't think about does exponential many think that there's an input sequence and an output one and uh, those are given and I want to have to know the score my my model is just giving scores for input output pairs okay so the scores are going uh, are going to be computed this way by putting a score on every part and summing them okay is that fair to everyone? Is that understood? So if I'm given the out, if I'm given an input and an output, this is clear, right? How we do it. The question is like now. The question is the following: How do how do I do predictions? Right. So assume that I have a score at the background level, okay? And now assume that I'm given an input, so everything is fixed. And now I want this. Give me the output sequence that uh, maximizes this sum. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. So that. That's the you know the prediction part, right? Uh, my model works at high ground level, but now I have an input giving a full input giving the full input. Okay, so the good news is that by restricting to this factorization, uh, I can use the literary algorithm, okay, which takes uh, a linear time, so that's the length of the sentence, and it's a quadratic penalty on the on the number of labels, okay. So note that two is the same as the number of labels I have here. Okay, so this is not a coincidence. Okay, so the the return algorithm makes an exact computation of this. Means it computes the sequence out of all possible ones. Computes the sequence, the output sequence for x that maximizes this score, and uh, in linear time in the length, and in quadratic time if we have five. If we have trigrams because we believe that we need the highest combo features, then it's going to be three. If uh, we say, oh no, I still need more features, I need four uh, labels at a time, so it's going to be four and so on and so on. So now I'm going to uh, explain the mechanics of this, or, or, or uh, not the mechanics, but the intuition of why this, this, this works. But the statement is clear. What, what is important in the lecture is not the mechanics of every single thing. The, what is important is the, the, the overall picture, what we want. We want to be able to predict, predict the structures, and we want to be able to have representations that capture the relevant things, okay, and that is problem dependent. But there is a trade off, right? So the statements are if you use this model, then the specificity is this one, but you don't have any practice. But if you use this other model that gives you this kind of exclusivity, then you have these guarantees and it's going to cost you that much to make okay? So that's the statement, okay? And then I hope you can believe me. And then uh, what I'm going to explain next is that this statement, it, I'm going to give you intuitions of why this statement is correct, okay? But 
even if you don't understand anything in the next few slides, if you understand the statement, that's good to go, right? Because the Vitaly algorithm is already invented, so then believe that it exists, use it, and you know, trust the mathematical community and the computer science that it's correct, right? Like move on. So, or go later and then work on it, right? So the question is like, you know, of uh, something complex, so divide the problem. So that's a question, yeah? Um, yeah, it's just a more of a practical question. So obviously I could have the labels be, you know, just not only location, but location in, you know, like beginning, inside, yes, so on. But I, have, yeah. but I have a penalty then as well, right? Because I have more labels, hence, you know, the algorithm would take longer. So I, I just wanted to ask you practically whether it would be better, you know, to have more detailed labels or take more context. Right, okay. Uh, well, okay. First of all, I should have uh, made uh, a note at the beginning that, so I'm talking about the magnetic structure and just having just these three labels. So my, so because my, my point of the lecture, and this because this is your lecture, my point was like, let's make the simplest possible problem, just that since we didn't like that. Now, you should always Go, whenever I talk about the task, you should always go and read actual papers. And whenever I, should, I talk about the model, you should like, go and read it. So the tasks that we have in the community on name and instruction are not as simple as these. Yeah. No. are more complex. So they include the labels. It's not just personal location. It also includes whether some sort of bracketing, when it's the beginning, the inside of that. And that is uh, it's super relevant also for the application. It's extremely relevant to know what, how many words is an empty dimension, right? Uh, and what the, where are the boundaries, so this is relevant. I'm not doing that just for the sake of simplicity, but always, so these are not real tasks. This is just for the purpose of slides and all that, right? This is to, to highlight the trade-offs. So, so, you know, if the task has 10 labels, uh, the task defines the number of labels. I cannot choose. So the, in this approach, the number of labels is given, okay? The number but of even labels. even just if you go with the bio or if you yeah, then you can try. You can I'm try what is better. I'm just practically if you had to, you know, if you had a constraint and you had to either get more context or get more fine grain labels, which one would you go or would it depend on the task? This is it's more of a practical response. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, meaning that um, I don't know. So goals are possibilities, and I think that there's uh, there's work in both directions. So you can either you can either if, when you model the score function, you have set of labels, certain set of labels, and you can say uh, I have two options, right? I work with simple labels, but I'm going to augment the scope. Or I'm going to change the labels so that the labels are richer in a way that they encode, uh, you know, that I don't need to look at that many labels. Yeah, that, that's a good, yeah. I think that actually, I think that that's been, uh, I think that that's been one of the main questions in the last uh, in the last years, and it's still going on. Actually, neural networks can be seen as I don't need to, I don't need to remember labels. I just create a state. And uh, that is really, that is working like uh, augmenting labels with hidden states, and uh, yeah, that points that to me. So it's part of the it's part of the the, the, the question. So I can see that when you, even though this is a toy problem in some or toy method in some sense, it's related with the entity resolution, right? So you know roughly how long entities exist, or you know, what are the typical ends by structure. So that probably makes a difference in your selection in the features in the toy example, even. right? So, yeah. So for instance, the uh, there's a lot of two length, two length, and the, but there's also three and four. So if you chose like three trigrams, then you wouldn't really benefit so much because it can still go on. If you knew that they always finish at the second, then that would be a benefit. But on the other hand. The length is somehow, it, but it's somehow, I see it's related to the uh, problem. And the end is another thing, because the, uh, if you only consider one sentence, the, the, the end is not going to be incredibly large. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's 
So yeah, uh, I think it's just a moment, right? Yeah, I, I agree. It, it depends on the yeah. Uh, yeah, the fact that that is so it, the lines are the, the examples are toy. The methods are not toy. Okay, the uh, transitions are illustrations. The, the algorithms and all that are not toy. So the actual model. So you should always go and say, okay, these these people in this paper, these people made this study on this data set, and it's always this set dependent. I said at the beginning, always pick. The simplest approach for your data, okay, which is not the data is not name ended in there. It's like that data set. And another, and another point is that if the n is not too big, then you could of course store the uh, the whole matrix, like the all of the scores from one to n, rather than just the sum. Even though it's a bit simple to store the sum, but if the n is really big, then I mean, if the n is big, then that would be not so big. So n is so we like the case where n is big. Uh, so it does it, you cannot you cannot remember all of that. You cannot capture all of that. So in the applications where the sentences are very short and then it's three, four, five, then you can go and and do not structure prediction, but just frame it as classification and you know uh, tackle all of that. Yeah. We can probably take one more question at this point because we have I would like to ask, could you use a combination of bigrams, trigrams? Programs. Good question. So, good question. Uh, yeah, sure. But it's just so uh, the bigrams are in the trigrams. So, if you have trigrams, you have bigrams, and you have unigrams. If you have bigrams, you have unigrams, right? So, what matters is the largest piece. In terms of speed, perhaps. In terms of speed, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So, if you have com you have combinations of that, and now the literary slides I'm going to show. Are not uh, for that case. Uh, yeah. So if, if you want to make so again, like all these are equations and illustrations and play those. So the, the real thing requires some part of thought, engineering, and things for the things to work. So uh, conceptually, if you have trigram representation, you also have bigram representation. And that's my focus today. Now, if you want to build that, so just instantiating all the trigrams is huge. So you cannot do that. So if you do that, it's going to be too slow. Now the the the, the tagers use trigrams. The current part of these tagers they use trigrams. So you know they use a sparsity. They use things. So they use. It's also hard to find uh, approaches where they use larger scopes only when needed. Okay, there's a lot. There's a bunch of stuff. But that's not so my lecture. Uh, unfortunately, for those who would like that, it's not like I'm going to review the best methods out there. It's the, on the opposite side. I'm going to just review the most simple things, since so that when there is a let's say a paper, you can say okay, this is about the representation, this is about the prediction, and this is about the learning, and that uh, I never understood, but I can. Uh, uh, and I never understood the mechanics, but, uh, maybe next year, but I still can still understand the paper if I don't really know that, because besides it has statements that I, I understand the statements, even if I don't understand fully the mechanics or the engineering. So being able to you know, identify different components and, and, and parts of that. Thanks. How, how many of you have, have seen it there? Okay. Um, okay. So warning, you know, for those who haven't, which is, is the most, uh, it's not something that the first time wow, you get it, right? So it's for several iterations. So um, I'm just gonna try to give you an intuition uh, that this algorithm exists and is useful. So the thing is that uh, okay, um, okay, I'm gonna do a change, right? Instead of writing every, I need to now write the scores uh, at each position uh, many times, right? So instead of writing all these. I just say, okay, the model is fixed, the sentence is fixed, I'm, I'm just, I just matter about what matters now is each position and it's bigram. Okay, so I'm gonna just, just use this notation instead of this. Okay. okay, so given the scores, and uh, here you can, like, all of them are computed, right? But I have a model, I have a, a sentence, and I have all these scores. You can think that they are in a matrix or list or something, okay? They are indexed. Uh, given all this, I want to find this. Okay, I want to find this, the, the full y that maximizes this sum. Okay, now this is not literary. This is just something that I find useful to understand this expression, right? Um, so now consider a certain x and two different uh, solutions. Okay, so this expression uh, it gives a score for each of them. 
And but these are these two solutions. They only uh, differ in one position. So uh, for the sake of non toy things, imagine that this is a hand length. The length of this is hand, right? And then the only difference is one, is one, is one position, right? So <clears throat> I want to I want to highlight that uh, we, what is the score of the second one relative to the score of y? So if I know the score of y and I know that only there's only a local change, do I need to recompute everything? Do I need to take y prime and consider all the migrants and sum them? Or or no, the answer is no. So the answer is there is a way by which uh, the score of y prime is equal to the score of y plus something minus something. Okay, any, any guess? So I'm scoring this way, the solution. It does one local change. If I'm only changing one label, uh, then the only scores that change are the ones that are relative to this change, right? So uh, there's this bigram, personal location, right? That I'm, I'm changing for a person person. And then there's also this bigram here, okay? I'm changing a location nothing. Uh, this is wrong, right? Person person. I'm summing person, person, and person, nothing. This should be person, yeah? This is, this is wrong, okay? This is minus and this is plus, okay? But the point is this one. So if I make one change, I only need to look at the locality, right? No matter how long this is, I don't need to look at that, right? Why? Because, or, or say that there's a long history behind. I don't, like, I don't need to look at that. Why? Because precisely this is a factor model, okay? The, the score at a certain position only depends on the vicinity on what we have in the factors. This is unlike greedy models. Okay, say that I'm doing a change here. A greedy model might have features that look at all the decisions before. So if I change, a, uh, if I change in a greedy model, I make a change, I need to go back, go back, and I cannot say, well, this is going to be the same as the other, but with this change. I cannot, there's no, there's no uh, relation between different solutions and different scores. We don't know, right? Here we do, okay? So output sequences that share bigrams also share scores. Okay, so the Viterbi will kind of make use of that property, but um, here, here's Viterbi. It's a dynamic programming algorithm that uses the following recurrence. Okay, assume that, and the, the statement is, is the following. Assume that for a certain position i and its label, we have the best subsequence from position i to 1 to i ending with label a. What does it mean? Okay, I have, I, I'm at position i of the sentence, okay? And I'm having three, I'm maintaining three subsequences that, that carry the best, okay? So this is the best subsequence from the beginning to position i that ends with person. This is the best subsequence that ends with location. This is the best subsequence that ends with nothing. So which possible label and position, I have this thing. Now I'm asking, say I'm, I'm given that, right? And I'm asking, what is the best um, what, does, what is the best sequence up to here, this position? Okay, so how can I augment these uh, sub-problems into a larger one? Okay, and uh, the solution is that the best sequence up to position i plus one needs to be either this subsequence with this bigram or this one with this one or this one with this one. So. In other words, if I know the best subsequence up to i for each ending with each of the labels, I can compute the best subsequence up to position i plus 1 with a very simple computation. I just need to maximize over the new, over the, the three possible things. I don't need to go back, okay? In other words, the best sequence here is made of the one of the best sequence here plus something else, okay? I don't need to go farther away. And this is because there's this sharing of scores, okay? That uh, the scores of the best will not change, okay? And this is because we have a, a bigram representation. So um, with this property that I can define a smaller problem and I have a way to make it bigger and bigger and bigger, I can make a dynamic programming algorithm, which is, uh, an algorithm stated as follows that will make this computation. Now this computation will go, uh, will start with uh, 
with uh, sequences that um, from the left that keep uh, growing and the way it works is that we define instead of so this is the problem we want to find the arc max I'm gonna forget for a second about the arc so I'm gonna just maximize I'm gonna define this problem okay I'm uh, the quantity delta I a is the score of the sequence from position i to 1 to i, so all from the left to position i that ends with a, so all the sequences of length i that length that end with a, uh, that maximize the sum of scores, okay? So this is a problem, okay? For each i and a, I have this sub-problem, okay? And so it turns out that I can solve all these sub-problems using the following recursion. So if my sequences are of just length one, it's trivial. I'm just having a score here. So here's a, well, here's a detail like when I, in the first position, there's no bigram, right? There, there's no label, there's no previous label. I'm just using this convention. So when sequences are of, of length one, this is uh, trivial. When sequences are of length i, what I need to do is what was highlighted here, right? I'm asking, what's, what is the best sequence up to here? Well, I need to check what was the best sequence and augment it and pick the best of the three possibilities, okay? So I need to, for each, for at position minus one, I need to pick what is, what is the best possibility of uh, going from B to A, okay? Where I'm looping over B, okay? Um, so now, this is the computation, and now if I solve all these problems, I have that in particular, the optimal score for the full sequence is found at position n, okay? But because position n is the score of the, all the sequences, of all the full sequence, okay? So, mm, the cost of, uh, you know, this is uh, the dynamic programming. The cost uh, is going to be linear times this. Why is this? Because n times number of y is the number of such problems. And each such problem involves a loop over the number of labels. Okay? Any quest questions here? So this y in uh, calligraphy, let's say, this y, is it yeah. does it represent the space of all uh, possible sequences of labels? Labels, labels. So, it, because, was it that some slides ago it was the all the search space, or am I mistaken? So, when so when I, that's a good point. So, wh wh when I do it like that, it's just a set of labels. So, this is looping over the set of labels, so this is tractable. Mm -hmm. When I do like that, it's a set of uh, sequences, okay, because it's labels exponentiated to the i. Yeah. yeah, it's a notational thing I should have pointed out because it's relevant. Because this is, I'm defining some problems at the sequence level, but then I find that each of the sub problems can be defined by only looping at the labels, right? So by, by, follow, by solving all these recursions one to next to each other, I can, in linear time and, you know, uh, because I do it this for n and for all a, and each of the problems involves looping over y, there's a quadratic dependence, right? Yes? So is the factored approach, can it be said that it's just a transition-based approach where you take into account only the previous one? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's correct. That's cor so that's correct. Well, kind of, because that, th that will depend on the, on the transition system, right? But so, for example, for the greedy model, if we make the greedy model only look at the previous label instead of all the previous ones, then we can always do predictions with the Viterbi algorithm, and that would be tractable. Okay, maybe let's do the break, and uh, I will I will continue with this later. Okay, I think uh, I'm gonna get started again. Um, Okay, so we, we, I just uh, described Bitterby. Um, again, I insist um, it's an algorithm. The important is the statement, uh, linear time quadratic in the number of labels. 
So there's two possibilities. You didn't know about Viterbi and now you know it exists or you already did know. In all cases, please, uh, you can look at these equations again. But more importantly, if you want to get the mechanics and there's two things, the so why this works and the actual mechanics, right? So there's a lot of literature that you can check. I think that um, it would take me a full three hour class to fully present the uh, Viterbi, so I'm not good doing that. Uh, this is specification, but again, to get familiar with that, learn that, prove it uh, mathematically, run it manually several times, uh, program it. There's also different ways to observe, to see Viterbi and, and understand it, um, so go ahead with it. So one thing I didn't mention, the Viterbi algorithm solves a max problem and we wanted the arc max, so we don't want to know the score of the best sequence, we want the best sequence, right? And there's a trick called the uh, back pointers by which once you have all these problems solved, you can recover the sequence. And I'm not going to describe how it works, but it's, it's simple. It's in the trace of these computations. Okay, and that's another thing I want to point out. So we saw greedy model that clearly goes left to right and can only go left to right, okay? And you might be thinking, well, actually, um, a factor model also goes left to right. No, a factor model is not directional, right? Now, the Viterbi algorithm, it goes left to right, but the model is not left to right, uh, okay? And uh, the, a way to see that, that I leave as a homework if you want, is like that you can rewrite the Viterbi algorithm, the equation says that the algorithm proceeds right to left, and right, it needs you need to you would need to redefine the way you define this problem, and then change the <coughs> instead of going left to right, you, you do it right to left. Okay, so it's possible to come up with such recursions that uh, come up with the same computation. Okay, which if you do that and observe it, you will then that's evidence that the model is not directional. The model doesn't run left to right or right to right. A greedy model needs to go left to right if you design it like that. If you want a right to left model, you need to start over again. A factor model is not like that. It's like there's a scoring of factors. Think of that in a parallel way. All factors are scored, all possible factors, and then out of all that scoring, the Viterbi algorithm goes and selects the best sequence, right? Now, that algorithm goes left to right, but it could go right to left, okay? It's important. Uh, and then there's uh, all these variations, right? One is uh, a sparse Viterbi that uh, occurs, which is related to a question I got over there. Uh, I don't, I don't even. Uh, so in many cases, only a few labels at every position apply. And this is the case for your afternoon homework, uh, which is on post-tagging. So on post-tagging, when we do post-tagging, Morse words are not ambiguous. Are just uh, they just mean one thing. A few words have m have some ambiguity, okay? But then, uh, if we do post-tagging, the number of labels in let's say the English Pentagon is 40, okay? But most words are not ambiguous; they just one thing. So it's just um, a waste to try all possible labels when only one is possible, okay? And also transitions. So not all transitions. Sometimes ahead of time we know that to does a transition is just not possible, right? So you can you can uh, think of a sparse Viterbi that instead of trying everything times everything, like my equations, it does a sparse. So it only it only considers the labels that apply to a position and only considers uh, the the label transitions, the bigrams that are possible. Okay, so you are cutting on this factor. Okay, this factor if 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 the number of labels is 40 or 100, this factor is very expensive, right? So if you cut that. And that typically requires a sparse implementation. The other is a higher order. So instead of factorizing at bigrams, we do it at trigrams. So the cost is going to be at the three or four grams at the four. So it's again very common in post-tagging. But because of this factor keeps growing, now this is becomes kind of very essential, right? So everybody who does high order factor models needs somehow to to do sparse Viterbi. There's always also a question: is like, can you do bigrams and trigrams? So there's all these course to find strategies and things that you can say like um, I'm gonna think make things speed up to cut on this factor, right? There's all it's always linear, but you can there's all many things you can do that and NLP, NLP literature is full of papers on that. Another variation that has nothing to do with this is that is the, um, the specification of what you want. So instead of want I want the single best, I want the k best, the the three best possibilities. 
okay? And you can also adapt Viterbi to compute k best instead of just one best, okay? And that is very useful. For example, the first uh, in the four approaches I mentioned, one f was re-ranking, right? So maybe you have a very simple model uh, that is factored, and then uh, you ask the model, give me the top 100 ones, okay, solutions, the top 100 most core solutions. And then once you have that set, you go and uh, you run a re-ranker, okay? So you need top k inference. Some loss functions in learning also use that because they use uh, k equal to. So they compare the top hypothesis with the second best, and that gives a notion of margin, okay? So it's very useful. And another variation of uh, Viterbi that goes in a different axis is, is the forward-backward, which I will review now, hopefully quickly. Uh, so, mm, so it's the Viterbi for some product computations. So Viterbi is doing a, okay, I have slides, so. So the Viterbi solves a maxim recurrent, okay? It's, we're asking for, now I'm forgetting about the arc, okay, I'm just, so we are summing scores and we want the max, okay? So we call it a maxim. Uh, but with the same, with a factor model, you can, you can think of a sum product, okay? So you do a product, so, for a sequence, you do a product of uh, scores, and then you you s you sum the scores of all sequence. So, and you will be thinking, and why do you want that? Okay, uh, just wait a, wait a few slides, okay? And I, I'll show you I'll show you a motivation for that, okay? But the question is like, this is a striking similar. We're replacing the max sum by a sum product, okay? And the the question is that this uh, this kind of um, computations, they, 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 they share the, the same properties which makes that the dynamic programming strategy works, okay? It's, it has to do with how uh, the sum distributes over the product or the max of the sum. So it falls under the same, and there's all this uh, theory that, uh, that covers that, but I'm not covering here. But I will, I will show you the fourth world algorithm, okay? Uh, if say that given an x, I want to sum, so over all possible sequences, I want to sum the score. And the score of a sequence is a product of scores, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna proceed very, so what it's doing this, I'm calling this uh, intermediate problems alphas. Before it, I was the max problem under Viterbi, I was calling it delta, now I'm uh, calling it alpha for that. And that's gonna sum, okay? So alpha IA, is the sum of all subsequences that fit in here that end with an A. It's the sum uh, where the, s the score of a sequence is a product, okay? So then I can proceed the same way, but whenever before I had a, a sum, now I have a product, and when, when I had a max, I had the sum. So I'm replacing these things, okay? And so I'm finding that if I want the, f the total sum here, I'm, I'm gonna, so these uh, alpha variables can be computed uh, given the previous one, only looping over uh, labels, so it's the same cost, and the total sum, I find it here, okay? So the, the, this, this algorithm, it's called the forward algorithm because it proceeds in a forward fashion, and it gives me all the alphas up to n, and so if I want the total sum, it's here, okay? And then there's also the backward, okay? Which it gives you just the, same kind of computations from, but from the backwards, okay? And it's called the backward algorithm. It's kind of computing the same thing. Look, they both computing the, the goal is the same. It's just that I'm gonna define it in a backward fashion. So uh, it's a bit funny here. Uh, the backward quantity, which is the red thing, it's like given a position I with label A, it's gonna sum this chunk of here. So assuming that I have an A here, What's the sum product of this part, okay? And then the recursions are the same, it's just that it runs backward from n at the end until one, okay? And then that's this recursion. I'm, I'm not gonna explain the recursions, it's just that, uh, so Viterbi can run forward and backward, and in Viterbi you can run for max sum or for max sum or for sum products, okay? And I'm giving you a motivation of, I'm, I, I'm, I'm introducing this because I will use it uh, in five minutes. But they all run the same, okay? Any comment here? Actually, this, I, I pose you a, 
a homework of writing the Viterbi algorithm in a backward fashion and kind of giving you here. So this is a backward algorithm, but for some products. So the homework was do this for max sum and realize that you get the, the arg max, okay? Um, any common question? Okay, so let's move on. So now uh, we saw, so, so far we saw arc factor models. So now I'm, now I'm, I'm changing chapter, okay? Enough about uh, computations, back to modeling, okay? And I'm gonna present a subfamily of models within arc factor, okay, that uh, we call log linear models, okay? And so let me define that. And so the, the main point here is that it's a probabilistic model. So before, so s till now I haven't talked about uh, probability distributions and I'm, I'm gonna talk about probability distributions. Why? Because it makes a lot of sense because uh, sometimes, so if we have distributions, uh, we have all the pro good properties that are behind distributions, okay? So in particular, if we think about predicting, it makes sense to think about conditional distributions, okay? And it makes sense to think about models for conditional distributions. So let me, uh, so a log linear model, it's gonna define a conditional distribution in a certain fashion, okay? So le let me make sure that we understand what is that we are defining first, okay? So we're defining a model of conditional distributions, okay? Uh, so what does it mean, okay? It means a conditional distribution means that if I'm given an X, which is uh, an input sequence, I get a distribution over all possible Y. So each possible sequence gets, you know, a probability and they all sum to one, okay? They are all positive and they all sum to one. That's a distribution, but it's a conditional distribution because if I change the, the input sequence, I get a different distribution over outputs, okay? So it's a condition on the input sequence. Now, it's not just that, it's a model, okay? So it means that there's a model that the parameters are W, says that for a fixed model, the fixed model for any X computes a distribution, okay? So, so each, this each input has its uh, uh, a distribution over outputs, but all these dis conditional distributions are of the same model, meaning that one set of parameters defines for any X, defines a distribution, right? Okay, so this is what uh, model of the conditional distribution. In the case of structure prediction, so this could be for anything, but in the case of structure prediction, these are sequences and these are output sequences, okay? Now, a what is a log linear model? A log linear model is a way to define this that is as follow. So first, we have our feature representation of inputs, outputs that we've seen. Then we have a linear scoring. So recall that a linear scoring can produce a score which is gonna be positive or negative. Now, just uh, practically, what a log linear model is going to do is to exponentiate this uh, score. So now, after exponentiating, the, the score is going gonna, is gonna to be always positive, right? Because if we exponentiate it, it goes positive. So this puts our score, the exponentiation puts the score into the positive. So now, I have that for any value x, y, I have that the value is positive. I need to make them sum to one, okay? So this is what the z is about. The z will go over every possible uh, sequence and compute the numerator, right? So we're dividing the, the exponentiated score of a certain solution by all the possible scores. So it's just we're making the cake and we're normalizing so it sums to one, okay? Um, so this is a log linear model which has been defined for many things. The particularity here is that we know that input output um, values are, are sequences, okay? So this will loop over all sequences and of course I'm gonna, I'm gonna be discussing that. But here's the definition of a log linear model, okay? So it's a conditional distribution that works by exponentiating and dividing that makes it positive and sum to one. And in addition to that, the exponentiation, these kind of models have a number of very good uh, statistical properties that make them suitable for machine learning, right? So it's very useful because with components that we already have, we can have this uh, probability distribution. So why would you like a probability distribution? Well, as I said, it's very useful, right? It gives you a notion of, of confidence based on probabilities. You can plug them, okay? Okay, so <coughs> in the next few slides, I'm gonna discuss this and show you that this is no other thing that a f uh, than a factor model uh, with the that has this probability interpretation, okay? Okay, first let's uh, take why this log linear, 
why, why it has this name? So, uh, or why it's called log linear? Okay, so mm, here's the, the thing. Okay, so uh, here's the so I'm gonna I'm gonna take the log of these probabilities. Okay, so uh, the log of the expression I just presented. Now the log of a fraction is the s the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. Now, but the log of an exp cancels, so I get this thing, uh, which is simple and understood. It's a, a linear prediction minus this thing, which to me it looks uh, horrible. I don't know if you agree with me. It's a log of a sum of an exponent over a uh, thing. But whatever, at the, um, I'm going to call this, this is the partition function, okay, the denominator. I'm going to call this log zx. And I'm going to observe that if I take x and y, okay, and I develop this expression, this expression effectively depends on x and y. But I'm going to observe that this expression does not depend on y. Okay, y is not here. Okay, so if I fix x, if I fix x, so I'm defining this distribution, this is a constant. Okay, it's it's how how is the sum of the cakes is that it normalized. Okay, so this is dependent on x. So, uh, so what this means is that if I fix x, uh, the y's are just this model is just making a linear model, and this is a constant, which is still in the linear space, okay? So a log linear model, it's modeling log probabilities. It's a, it's, a probabil it's a conditional probability model that in the log space is linear. That's called log linear, okay? It's modeling probabilities in a log linear fashion, okay? So why is this useful, that it's a linear model in the log space? Okay, so let's, let's say that I have this log linear model, uh, and for tractability, let's assume that this thing decomposes into bigrams as we saw in the first part of the lecture, okay? Now, let's say that I have a model, I have this that I train, I'm given an input, and I want to find the arc max, the best structure. So it makes sense to ask for the structure, the output uh, sequence that has the max probability, okay? So I'm gonna so, uh, formulate this as an arc max problem, uh, I have this uh, huge uh, thing here. The first thing I'm going to do is that because I'm, I'm searching for y's, I'm interested in y's, and this uh, partition function is independent of the y, in terms of maximization, I can drop it, okay? I can drop it because it's a constant. It's not going to change the identity of uh, the maximizing sequence. It's going to change the score of a maximizing sequence, but not the identity, okay? So I can drop it so that it's simplified, okay? I drop that, and then f uh, again, for the purpose of maximization, searching for the maximizer of exponentiated score versus uh, searching for the maximizing of the score without the exponentiation is also the same, okay? So I'm going, I can drop the, so for maximization pros pur uh, purposes, if I want to compute the argmax, I can drop all the probability apparatus. <coughs> okay, which means that in terms of sequence prediction, this probabilistic log linear model is just a factor model that we saw uh, equipped with some probabilistic apparatus of exponentiating uh, and, uh, and uh, dividing. But it doesn't affect the fact that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a factor model. That's why I say that it's a, it's a subfamily of, of factor models, okay? So, and because we know that factored models can uh, use, uh, have these uh, factorization properties, in order to solve this, we can use the Viterbi algorithm as we just showed uh, five minutes ago, okay? So, um, probabilistic models are factor models if we assume this, okay? If we assume a factorization, the probabilistic model is still a factor model, okay? And we can use the Viterbi. Okay, uh, there's to some other computations that uh, I want to I want to quickly describe, okay, that occur when you have a probabilistic model. While if you don't, if you have a factored model that is not probabilistic, they are not very meaningful, okay. The one is like I'm giving you a pair of x and y. I'm giving you that, and I'm asking what is the probability, okay? What is the probability, okay? So we just need to. Uh, uh, take the expression 
And then the numerator, it seems simple. We compute the feature vector of x and y, which we have x and y, so we can compute the feature vector. We compute the, the score, and we exponentiate. So this numerator is given x and y. It's, it's easy to do. But the partition function involves summing over all uh, of, of, over any y, okay? Sorry, but this y and this y are not the same, okay? This is a given y. This is the y that we use to as a, as the iterator here, okay? It's not the same, right? So, in computing this z quantity involves summing over all of that. So again, it's like how in log linear models can be defined, but for any linear model, but the fact that this is a structure prediction. The fact that it's structure prediction makes that some computations become not tractable or become challenging. Okay, not tractable, not because actually it is tractable. Okay, because this is a sum over y's of an exponentiation of the linear score for each thing. Okay, now if we do some al algebraic messaging, um, what I'm doing here, yeah, what I'm doing here is like develop that this is not, is, is actually a factor score, okay? It's a sum over the scores of the factors, and I'm going, I'm going to use a, a notation here, S, so like in Viterbi, I'm going to use this notation to, to, to just denote this. So this a score is given by a sum of a scores of the factors. And now, expo the exponent of a sum can be turned into a product of exponents. Okay, so my expression is a sum product. So I need to solve a sum product that sums over exponentially large solution. So because it's a sum product, we can do the forward. We can use the forward algorithm where I set the scores to be not the linear scores uh, that my model predicts, but the exponentiated ones. Okay, if I set if I set this forward algorithm with exponentiated scores, I get the partition function in uh, linear time quadratic the number of states uh, and I can plug it here and I can compute okay so the fo so I just gave you a motivation for the forward algorithm okay um, a second one very important marginal probabilities of a single label okay so now forget about it. I have a model and I have an input sentence and the situation is the following so normally you would like give me the full prediction okay but let's say that I don't care about the full sequence I for some reason I only care about the, I only care about what is the label uh, at this position, okay? What is the best label at this position? Or in particular, what's the probability that Paris is labeled as person in given this sentence for your model, okay? I have a model that computes probability distributions over full output sequences. It's normal that I can ask, well, what would you assign here, okay? So what we're asking is what is the marginal probability of this, okay? So what we're asking is we have a model that has distributions over full output sequences. We're asking for the marginal distribution for a particular position on, on a sequence, okay? And uh, we just need to go to the theory of probability distributions and see that this is a basic, um, um, a basic formulation that the marginal distribution of a certain subset of uh, random variables of a distribution is obtained by summing over all events that have that subset, okay? So in our case means that I'm gonna call the marginal um, at a certain position of a label mu of i of a, so here it would be if I put person here, mu of i at this position, one, two, three, mu of three of person is the probability that the third label is person given the full input uh, under the model, okay? So I'm gonna sum, I'm gonna obtain this by summing over all full output sequences that happen to have that value, okay? So I'm gonna consider all possible ways of labeling the full sequences that have this person here, okay? And then I'm gonna uh, compute the probability of each such case and then sum, okay? So that, that's, that's the definition. That's a, for, any, uh, con for any probability distribution, the marginal distribution is, is defined like that. Now, in our case, uh, because our distribution is of sequences, this involves summing over sequences, okay? 
we do some uh, massaging here and uh, it's beautiful to discover that um, this quantity here, this sum of products, is the product of the alpha, the forward quantity at position i with a, times the backward quantity of i and a. Okay, let me, this is the picture, okay? This is what we want, okay? We want to know the probability at this position, and the alpha takes care of summing all possibilities up to here, and the beta takes care of summing all possibilities up to here. Okay, so it's that if we do the product, we get this sum. You agree, it's beautiful. Okay, and then if we sum these two, we need to divide by the partition function, which can is also given by the by the by the by the forward algorithm. Okay, so I'm not uh, talking about uh, what we do here. Again, you can go and read. There's plenty of literature, but the question is this: that uh, with these computations, we can uh, solve many other questions, like what's the probability of a certain place, at uh, the certain position. And there is more. We could ask for the mar marginal probability of a label bigram. So what's the chance that at this position I have this not one label, but this pair of labels? Okay, and I'm I'm uh, I'm making this assumption that when I ask for a label, the probability of a label bigram at the position, I mean the current label and the previous one. Okay, so again, I'm asking for a marginal probability of having label B at position i and label a at position y minus i given the sentence and the model. And so that will involve uh, summing over all possible sequences that have these values in this position, okay? And then we get that it's something like that. So we compute uh, this, uh, this thing by taking the marginal up to this uh, word Taking the so the for sorry taking the forward up to here taking the backward up to here and making the product of the contribution of this uh, transition okay this is what our mo the scoring of a bigram the exponential scoring of a guy bigram right so again you can uh, you can uh, check literature but the main point the main point is that uh, by having factored models we can make all these computations in linear time. Mm, with a panel with a with a term on the number of labels, right? And all of this is fast um, and useful. Okay. So to wrap up this part on factor models, so we're I've been discussing quite a lot uh, models that have this form. They do sequence prediction by enumerating all possible sequences and doing a linear uh, product, but if we want this maximization, so there's, there's several options. If we want this expression to be tractable, to be able to pick the best one, so we can do it if we have factored representations, right? For example, at bigrams, okay? So uh, is it flexible in terms of representation? Is it satisfactory? Well, so we can take features of the full input and the piece each piece, each factor, okay? So if we think that for our application, that our, our factors include that information, it's gonna be successful, okay? If the information relevant for a task is beyond the factor, then your model will be a weak model, okay? Which means, it doesn't mean it's not useful, but it's weak, it will never uh, fully solve your task, okay? Uh, the main advantage of assuming a factor is a factor representation is that we can do uh, efficient predictions using Viterbi, or in addition, if we equip our model with a probabilistic apparatus, then we also can compute uh, computations like uh, of marginals, okay, using forward backward. Okay, those computations only make sense if there's a probability distribution. Okay, but it's all the same family of models. Okay, so next, finally, I'm going to focus on learning the parameters. So any question about all these models and computations and representations? No questions at all? So either you fully understand it or you're fully lost. <laughs> okay, I hope you're not fully lost. Um, I, 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 I'm assuming some of you are partly lost and that's normal. After all, it's me who is who is teaching. But um, I hope that at least the main concepts are there. And so what's the time? 
Okay. Okay. So finally, uh, so you know, we've rebuilt of this. Okay, transition-based models, factored models, and some algorithms with Derby and log linear models that apply to factored. And now, finally, we're gonna we're gonna focus on learning. Okay. Um, and so let me start with some sort of uh, game that is. Uh, it's it's just it's not a game it's a toy okay but i want you to get into the mind of what is learning okay so learning is um and this 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 connects with the representations and all that okay learning is like we have training data in our case we have a bunch of sequences for in this toy is just six sequences okay and it's each sequence comes with the correct uh, labeling okay and so we need to come up with some weight vector that kind of uh, makes the predict so that that defines a model and that makes that the predictions would be correct, right? Um, so here, so it's like uh, we know that mm, you know if a model is at zero, so let's say that I have some feature representation of that can capture any feature, okay? And I need to put some weights associated to features that make uh, the prediction possible, okay? So uh, let me start with an example. I could say, I could say, well, so all the word, I could, I could say all the words that are lowercase uh, and that have an assignment of, um, of a no entity get a, a point of plus one, okay? So this is what features, so features is capturing whether a word is lowercase and has a certain assignment, and the weight vector puts a weight on that. Okay, so if I if I do if I set a weight vector that everything is zero except this simple thing, suddenly, okay, all the all the lowercase vectors out of the three labels that are possible, there's one that has more score, right? So here you you can think, don't think sequentially, think. Uh, like you are just doing classification, right? So for each word, you are doing a classification. So because of this feature, this label has uh, has more score than any other label, and so the the lower case are gonna get assigned this. So blue means that in this slide, blue means correct. Uh, while the other the other words that are uppercase, uh, this feature doesn't apply because doesn't apply. So all the scores get, all the labels get the same score, which is zero, okay? Now, I'm gonna say that all the uppercase words uh, that are assigned person get a plus one, okay? So if I do that, this is correct, but this, which is uppercase, this would be assigned one, a, a, a person, but it's a location, so this is a mistake, okay? I'm making a mistake because of, of the uppercase words, not all of them are persons, right? So some are locations. So this feature is too weak, okay? So actually, is there a better way to to make, to put a weight on, on this kind of feature? Can someone think? So by, by setting this feature to one, I'm getting one, two, three, four words correct, but I'm getting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven incorrect right so it seems that I, I i'm saying that all the uppercase uh words that are persons should be preferred but actually there's one class location is more is more frequent so given my data the upper so the most frequent class for uppercase words is location it's not person right so maybe the model should prefer putting weight here, not here, right? Or maybe to both, okay? So can, how can we solve the other, the other tasks, right? So the model, so assume that, assume that I gave lots of features, okay? And the learning algorithm needs to look at the examples and uh, by putting weight to some coordinates, some parts of the structure of the sequences will be right, like the blue parts, and some part will be wrong. So the, you can think that the model has the ability to change the weights and it should do it such that at the end everything is correct, right? Everything in the training is correct. That would be minimizing the training loss. Also, it should be that it's simple, right? We, we, we are told by the theory that the model should try to do simple things. So it's, it's you know, under simple features like uppercase, it's 
more simple to put it to the most frequent one than to the other one, right? So let's do more sophisticated features, lexicalized one. So the model can figure out that while all the uppercase words are locations, if I see Maria, it's a person, right? So by, you know, by putting weight on this feature, we just learned that Maria is a person name. So I can learn, I can induce that only from data, right? Because I can, I can extract that this is a good assignment, okay? And I can keep doing that. So by just having, by just instantiating a word template that captures every word with every uh, class, I can learn from data that some words are associated with certain names. So I can say, well, these are person names without previous knowledge, okay? Without previous knowledge. Um, I can also learn that if the next word is went, then this is likely to be a person name. Or if the next word is played, this is likely to be an organization, no, not a location name. So somehow the learning strategy is saying, put all capital uppercase words as a location because that's the most frequent thing. And then let's correct the rest with more complex features, right? Because uh, a feature looking at words is more complex that, than a feature just looking at capitalization. And so we can keep going like that and know that I almost got everything correct only doing just simple classifications without looking at, ni at nearby labels, right? So up to here, it's what all you can do with just multi-class without considering any sort of sequence prediction. Now, sequence prediction allows you to have features like uh, if you see person next to person, you should really prefer, I give you 100 points, okay? Every time that you put two adjacent persons, I give you 100 points. Every time you put two adjacent locations, I also give you 100 points. Every time that you switch from location to person or the opposite, I subtract 100 points, right? Every time that, or, or you can have also things that rule out, right? If you put here, if plate is the next word to something assigned location, you should really rule it out, right? So the weight, the learning algorithm, by, by giving the le learning algorithm the proper representations of properties of inputs and labels and properties of chunks of the output, by giving this representation and expressivity, the learning algorithm can put some weights to positive, to negative, in the most simple way to uh, fit the training data and keep, keep it simple to generalize. Understood? So that's the, that's the goal of the algorithm. And I'm putting here because it's extremely important that we have models that give the correct representation, right? A sophisticated loss function without the correct representation has no chance at all. Yes, so this is, it is extremely important, and that's why I focused uh, up to this time of the lecture only discussing features and representations. Okay, so let's look at the first um, example of an algorithm. Which is the, um, I think it's the, the most simple approach to structure prediction, but the good news is that it's not only simple, it works very well, okay? Um, so it has to be the first to present, and you will understand that. Actually, there's there's the homework today. It's about that the structure perceptron, okay? And uh, yesterday Ryan uh, introduced perceptron, so you uh, you will actually not see much change here today, okay? The perceptron algorithm is a mistake-driven one. Like in the the toy uh, example I gave, you start with a weight zero, uh, weight vector of, of zero. And then you do a series of iterations that are called epochs, where at each iteration you visit all the examples, x and y, y is the correct sequence for x. Then you make a computation, which is like, give me the best prediction for this, uh, for my x, give me the best prediction, I'm calling this z. And then there's two cases, that this was perfect, or that this was, that's some mistake, okay? so. It's a mistake driven algorithm. It means that if there is a mistake, means that the, the two predictions are not equal, then I'm going to do an update. Okay? So, what is the update? The new weight vector is going to be the old one plus the features of the correct 
a structure minus the features of the incorrect um, a structure, okay? And you keep looping over that, and if you do that for five, ten iterations, this um, works well, okay? So, so this is actually exactly like Ryan's perceptron that he, he showed yesterday, correct? So what is the difference here? What makes this different? The features? The Z is a sequence, right? So the Z is a sequence and this has implications over uh, recovering the arc max, right? Because the theory, if you go to the theory, say you should pick the arc max, okay? So, but there are cases in which this can be solved with no problem, right? Which is factor models. So if we have a factor model, okay? Recall uh, in the middle of the first part, I said, you know, a factor model can be thought as a, a linear model, okay? Where this representation is factored, right? So now it's, it's where it's handy. So Perceptron says, if you pick the, if you have a linear model and you pick the max prediction, then by doing these updates, things work. Now, we have a, fac the fa a factor model is a linear model like that. And we know that by being factored, we, we can recover that automatically. So Perceptron will just work, okay? There is a modification of Perceptron that has nothing to do with, with the fact that we are doing a structural prediction, which is averaging, okay? Which makes, so Perceptron without averaging is not that good. With averaging is much better, okay? Uh, it's very simple. It doesn't change the main, the main thing about the structure. It's just having, instead of having one parameter vector, it has two, the average one which is something that at every, at after every, um, uh, after visiting every example, irrespective of not of whether there was a mistake, you keep summing the weight vectors. So this is a sum over all weight vectors that were generated, okay? And there's, there's ways by that to show that this is a lot more robust, okay? But um, the point is this one, that if we have a factor model, because it is a linear model, it uh, any algorithm for uh, linear models will just work. Will just work because uh, the theory uh, is for linear models. Now, the algorithms will ask you about computations. Okay, like this one. Perceptron asks you, give me the top prediction. Okay, so if you can provide, that's why having a factor model is so, is so important because if the model is factored, it's both linear and it has these computations. So if I have a model that, is that I can represent this as a linear and I have the computations that an algorithm asks me, then I can plug and play. And here's where the, at the beginning of the lecture said, all the algorithms for classification also work here. We just, is, is, there's just a, a computational aspect, okay? So it's, it's this one, okay? So if, if we develop the models with care mm, that are computationally tractable, the algorithms are plug and play. Um, okay, what else? Um, Okay, things that are uh, an observation that I think uh, is going to also be relevant for your homework. Um, that how is an update, okay? Because uh, this is just the, the, the generic form of perceptron. But we know that our X and Ys uh, are sequences, okay? So let's say, let's look at, a, I want to point out something. Let's, let's imagine that this is the sentence this is the correct uh, output, and at uh, some iteration, this is the the this is the the output that we that the the current model predicts. Okay, so it's an output that is almost correct but has one mistake, and this this is common, right? Because it's not that when you run you, at the at the very beginning, perceptron the model is is bad, but after just a few updates, a few updates, the model becomes moderately good. Okay, it will still not be very good but it's moderately good, meaning that almost everything that it predicts is correct, and from time to time there is a mistake. So whenever we predict sequences, it makes sense to think that after Perceptron has, been, has done some, some work, then almost everything will be correct, okay? So what, uh, what uh, is very common is that we predict Z, but it's not that Z is completely different of the correct. There's only one difference, okay? Let's assume that there is only one difference, okay? So let's develop the update. The update G, which what it's whatever we sum. Uh, so this thing I'm calling it G. That's the 
the, the correct feature vector minus the incorrect one. I'm calling it G, okay? It's just, uh, we know, because it's factored, is the sum over all the factors of X times Y minus the sum of all the factors of X times Z, okay? These are the factors that are in each of these two solutions. But uh, the factors here are the same, right? So this, this part, and this could be a, a sentence which is 100 tokens, okay? All this uh, is the same, and all that is the same. So if there's only one difference, there's only uh, four factors that are affected, right? So we're, there's only, we're changing, um, we only need to change person location by person person. Person location is the negative, uh, the, the feature vector we subtract to person person. And then on the right side, we are summing person nothing and we're subtracting location nothing, okay? So the update, even if the sequences are long, if, the if there's only a few mistakes, then the update will only involve a few feature vectors, okay? So the perceptrons up updates are very sparse. Only a few changes are done. Now, whenever we use old style feature vectors, the feature vectors are also sparse. So now, here's the situation. Perceptron starts with a weight, weight vector, which is zero. The updates is it does are very sparse. And actually, the features of each, the feature vectors of the update are also sparse by construction. So if you make a sparse sums of a sparse vectors, you end up with a sparse vector, okay? If everything that you add to a zero vector is a sparse, you end up with a very sparse vector. So a property of perceptron, in addition to running, being very simple, running very fast, fitting in one slide, which is the only algorithm that, that does that, um, the vectors they generate are very sparse. And this is kind of useful because you can look, after training a perceptron, you can look at all the, uh, out of all the features that you generate, which are millions sometimes, the few ones that got some weight that is non-zero, okay? So the positive ones will be correlated with the evidence, the negative ones will be things that you want to move away from, okay? So it is useful for interpretation for many things. For speed, it's uh, very fast uh, to predict, right? Okay, so um, some properties of perceptron. It's an online algorithm studied in the theory. There's a whole theory community in machine learning on all online, online algorithms that keep uh, on a stream of data, keep receiving uh, points and then getting a corruption. Okay, uh, in practice, we run it in batch mode, but it's, uh, it's very efficient for the way it works very efficient, much more efficient than the batch algorithms like the one we're gonna see now, um, CRFs and things like that. If, the, uh, like yesterday, if the data is separable, it, it will converge to parameter values with zero errors, okay? That's the, the theory behind perceptron with linear models. Since we have a linear model, the theory applies. Uh, also, there's an, if we use the average, you can relate that to, to, to notions of margin. That is good. So this was training error. So it's not super interesting. It means that it converges, but it's, it's training error. So training error, minimizing the training. What is, what is important in learning is the generalization, right? And margin can be related to generalization. So the average perceptron, there's a very nice paper, the paper by Fern and Shapir. Okay, they discussed the averaging trick. And, and it's not just a trick, there's a, there's a whole theory behind. So there's properties that, that make it generalized. So in practice, in NLP, averaging improves performance a lot. That goes from uh, not using averages is a moderate model. Using averages, it gets you models that are typically as good as, uh, as CRFs or SVMs, which are a lot more uh, complex and, and expensive to train. And also, uh, with perceptron, you typically reach a good solution only after a very few iterations, okay? The after, after visiting uh, the data once or, or twice, you already get uh, the performance and then it, it improves. I, I have a plot uh, right there. Now, this was, so up to what I said here, this applies well to factor models because they are linear models, they have tractable argmax and so on. Now, um, the first part of the lecture, I also presented transition systems, which cannot recover the argmax, okay? And as a workaround, we use beam search to make them more robust, but still it's not the argmax. Well, so 
the news are not so bad in the sense that the structure perceptron can also be used with beam search instead. So uh, again, beam search is an approximation to the ArcMax. It's not the ArcMax, but it's, it's still a robust search. Uh, there's been work, Collins and Rourke. Actually, Collins developed the structure perceptron, and then uh, later on they, they applied uh, the perceptron to a transition-based uh, shift reduce parser using beam search and with the, the structure perceptron, right? That later many people took that time. So this is an excellent paper showing many types of transition systems uh, all trained with perceptron and beam search. Then there's other ways that have been proposed of how you should define a loss function whenever you use perceptron and beam search. There's different considerations. Okay, um, so here's here's an experiment I did like 10 years ago on a parsing task. Uh, this is a with a with a parsing model that is arc that is factored. Okay, so this it's the convergence I want to point. So the final result, let's say it's it's 91, close to 92, but after just one or two iterations, you almost get uh, the full performance you're gonna get, right? The f after one iteration, this is quick, you almost get it, then you run it more and it improves a bit. So Zhang and Clark, uh, they run Perceptron with beam search. So each curve is the size of the beam. So meaning that V1 is just a greedy model. It only maintains the best hypothesis. V2 maintains two best hypotheses at each point up to 64. Clearly we see, so there's two things that we observe here. Th so this is test performance. So for different beams, it's the performance on the test in terms of accuracy, be better, uh, higher is better, uh, after training the model for several iterations. So the first thing that we observe for a trained model is that beam search really improves. Okay, from not using beam search to using some, it really improves. Uh, and the second thing we observe is the same as this one. So after just one, two, three iterations, we get most of with the final performance, right? So the first iterations tell you, because at, in practice, it's like you don't, you, you, you take a task and you don't know how good you're gonna do. And then you try this architecture and then you try these features and then you change the features and all that. So at the end, you, 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 you need to try lots of different combinations of models and features to f come up with a good model. So then it's not true that we just train one model and everything goes automatically. Th that's not true. We need to do lots of uh, validations. So if you have, mm, I don't know, 10 choices or 100 choices of different configurations of models, it's very useful that just after a few iterations, you get a sense of how that's going to work, right? Uh, so it's very useful that you just have to wait a few hours to maybe dis discard. So I'm trying this configuration, I run it for three iterations, it's very bad. So there's no chance that with more learning, this is going to get uh, anything better. So out, out, out. Okay. And while maybe you try any one, oh, after two iterations, it's getting here. So maybe there's a chance I will train it more. Okay. So this is, um, if you have experience, you already know what I'm talking about. If you still haven't started uh, developing models, you will see that um, model validation is something that takes a lot of time. So these are useful properties. Okay, um, questions about Perceptron? Yeah. Thank you. If you go back to the first slide about the Perceptron, and uh, the very, very basic slide. Um, I'm not sure if the W, if the, w if the weight vector is uh, the same for every Z or if we insert any kind of uh, uh, differentiation, uh, difference. For every Z? What do you mean every Z? For every Z. Z ah, for, for, ev ev for every sequence. The weight vector is always the same. You are training the goal now we're taking a model, the features are fixed, we have training data, yeah. we have a weight vector, and we want to give values to which weight of the weight vector. Okay, so we have one weight vector that we're gonna train by doing this. So all the rest, is F is fixed, and the data is fixed. That does that answer your question? There's yeah, only perfectly, yeah. yes. Okay, okay um, right, so, uh, now uh, we saw Perceptron, which is the simplest uh, thing. 
Um, and now we're gonna, I'm gonna present uh, CRFs. In order, to, in order to, to, to present CRFs, I need to go to the world of probabilistic models, okay? And I already presented that. I'm gonna work with log linear models, okay? So log linear model, this is a summary slide of what we saw before. A log linear model is a factor model, is a factor model that defines a conditional distribution, okay? And by being factored, we have all these good properties that we can predict and all that, okay? But still a linear model with this probabilistic interpretation. And now, say that I want to train uh, this probabilistic model, and before I said, well, it's very useful to have probabilities, and I handed my things, okay? But here's one particular thing that a probabilistic uh, model gives you and a non-probabilistic model doesn't, okay? Which is a criteria to estimate W, okay? So, in particular, I'm given training data, how do I uh, can estimate W, okay? So, I can define the conditional log likelihood of the data according to the model, okay? This is also called cross-entropy in this uh, new decade, uh, but um, we have always call it the conditional log likelihood, okay, which is uh, defined as follows. So, I'm given, a m it's something, I'm given a model, I have data, I'm given a model represented by W, and this is just, over all the examples, the probability that the model assigns to the correct, uh, this is the correct structure, okay? So what is the probability that my model, for each uh, training pair, that my model assigns to the correct structure, okay? And I'm taking the logs, okay? And I'm having this expression, okay? The, the, the reason why I sum and log is just because it has good properties so that we can move on, okay? So, but the point is that this thing measures how well W explains the data, okay? So, I'm searching for W. Learning is about searching for a W that worked well out of all possible Ws. So, what becomes very useful is to have a way to say this W is better than this other one, okay? And this is the a likelihood is a way to do that, okay? So a good value for W will give a high value for the probabilities, right? We want a W that effectively says for the data, for the training data, mm, the probabilities of the correct ones, of the correct values are high, okay? The model predicts probabilities for values. So we want a model that predicts high values for the correct uh, answers, okay? so. Essentially, if we have a likelihood criterion, we want we can frame learning as pick a W that maximizes this likelihood. Okay, it's a notion of, you know, mm, I, I I set a criteria and I pose learning as maximization of that. Okay, uh, but in the modern times, uh, we don't. We don't frame learning as maximizing, we framing as admi minimizing, and we talk about loss functions. Uh, yesterday, Ryan talked about that. So instead of maximizing the likelihood, I'm going to minimize the negative likelihood, which is an equivalent, it's an equivalent uh, formulation. And I'm going to use the framework of loss plus regularization. Loss uh, says how well my model is explaining the data. Regularization is uh, a bunch of uh, penalties that make, that we, we want to favor simple parameter sets, okay? Simplicity favors generalization, okay? This again comes from the theory of linear models or actually nonlinear too, okay? Um, okay, so if, the, 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 the thing is, if um, my model is probabilistic, my loss function can be the negative log likelihood, and then I can use gradient descent. I can optimize this by gradient descent, and if, if, if it, it happens that I can compute gradients, then I can run it, okay? Um, so I need to make sure, to complete this, I need to make sure that I can uh, run gradient descent, that I, everything is computable, right? Because it is defined, okay? If it's, if it's probabilistic, the conditional likelihood is defined. I set it like that, to close the, the to close the the method, I need to make sure that everything is tractable. Okay, where again, the fact that we're dealing with the structures has implications on on the tractability. Okay, so now there's two 
uh, ways. They there's two common loss functions based on uh, uh, based on the likelihood. One is the local loss, and the other is the global loss. Okay, the local loss is something sometimes called uh, MEMM, Markov Entropy Markov Model. Okay, which we assume we make a further assumption that our distribution of our sequences further decomposes, and the global loss we don't we don't take that assumption. We live in the global sequence world. Okay, so let me see if I can do this uh, quickly, which is uh, challenging, but I'll try. Okay, so the local uh, the local model takes first takes the the distribution um, over sequences. And further decomposes that into predicting a sequence is predicting the first symbol of the sequence times predicting the rest of the sequence given the first. Okay, this is the change rule. Okay, and if you apply this change rule, it means that the probability of a sequence is the probability of the first times the probability of the next given the rest. Okay, so this is the change rule. We can always take any distribution and apply the chain rule by that, okay? Now, the Markov assumption is, I'm going to assume that the probability of the next symbol given all the previous ones is the same as the probability of forgetting about, uh, only remembering the last one, the previous one, okay? So, this is the Markov window, okay? It's the Markov assumption, okay? You can forget about the full uh, prefix, you only need to remember the preceding label. Okay, so this is a mark of assumption of order two. Not that this is really related to factorization, right? So by, if we take a model from sequences to sequences and apply this, and apply this assumption, we get a factor model that is modeling. So we we're gonna learn, we're gonna estimate this, okay? So instead of, we define the laws at this level, but we're gonna estimate this model, okay? So we'll be able to write that the probability of a uh, sequence is the probability of the first symbol times the probability of a symbol given the previous one, okay? It's a factored representation. Now, instead of, now if, if now it, this is the model I'm gonna learn, I can put the likelihood at that level, okay? And so that's what local log linear models are gonna do, are gonna are gonna require that the likelihood of predicting the next symbol, given the previous one, is is good. Okay, so the probability here is of uh, a sequence at a certain position predict a symbol given the previous one. Okay, and uh, the log likelihood is expressed like that. It loops over all sequences, over all positions, and predicts the probability of a certain label given the previous one, okay? So I'm just using a likelihood at the local level. We're trying to have distributions that whenever I have, I'm, I have a predicted the label, I want to predict the next one, that the correct label is, uh, is the one that has the most probability, okay? So local, local log linear laws means that the likelihood is at the label uh, level, okay? So the gradients here, I said that the important part was that everything was tractable, okay? So if we develop the gradient, it, it comes with two terms, and both are, they are ugly, but they are easy to compute, okay? There's no, so this loops over examples, this loops over positions, this is just a, a vector, and this loops over labels, okay? So there's no loops that are not tractable here, okay? So check, good. Okay. Now, what are CRFs? Okay. CRFs. This is the definition. Okay. And the likelihood, it's not going to go down to the predict the next symbol level. It's going to keep at the sequence level. Okay. So I'm I'm using less assumptions. Before I was doing a step further. Here I'm not. I'm just saying, this is the model I want, because I want to model output structures given input ones. This is the loss I want. I want that, you know, the correct uh, output sequence is the highest in probability given uh, the input sequence. Now, um, if now we develop the gradient, 
we also see that it has two parts, observed feature vector. So this loops over sequent training data, and this uh, has two parts, the observed things and the expected ones. And what we see is that this loops over sequences. Okay, so again, this gradient, we won't be able to compute that because we, uh, we cannot loop over all sequences unless there's something that makes this tractable, okay? And the answer is that because we are assuming that our feature representation is factored, it turns out that I can write the gradient in terms of, so the gradient part, this loop over sequences, I can write it as a loop over marginals. Now, instead of looping over full sequences, I'm looping over positions and bigrams in this position, okay? And I'm taking the marginal, okay? So, to sum up, okay? The CRF loss is at the global level. I need to compute the gradient. The gradient involves summing over all sequences, but that can be done with marginals. And marginals, because we have uh, a factor model, can be computed with the forward-backward algorithm, right? So, what I was showing 20 minutes ago or 40 minutes ago about uh, these computations of a log linear model turns out to be essential in order to define a CRF because the CRF works at a global level and we'll ask for marginals for what's the probability that this bigram is here under your model, okay? And we need to be able to compute that, okay? And forward backward gives you that, okay? So in summary, so log linear, log linear models have this kind of form and define a likelihood uh, function which is useful to define a loss function, okay? Um, the computations factorize on, on label bigrams of this form. The prediction, if we want to uh, compute predictions, we use Viterbi and for parameter estimation, we will need to use uh, forward backward, okay? Um, I only was talking about the computation of, of the gradient, then the gradient-based method itself, you need to plug it, you can use any, any routine. Actually, I think I have a slide over here. Well, you can use any uh, SGD, LBFGS, any method. So let me insist again on this question about local loss or global loss. What, what is going on? We might, if we want to uh, finish on time, we might maybe skip parsing and um, yeah. I think it's, it's more relevant I worry about this. So I presented two types of losses, the local loss and the CRF loss, okay? So again, in both cases, I'm, I'm having a distribution over full sequences given input sequences. So it's not about the difference between local and global, it's at the loss level. It's not the, the, the model, the type of machine is the same, okay? But at training time, either I, in local loss, I set the loss to be at the label prediction level, at each label, or I set the log loss to look at full sequences, okay? So both exploit the same factorization and the same features. There's not, it's not that one is more expressive than the other. Both compute predictions in the same way, okay? The difference is that the local loss is locally normalized, okay? This, uh, this thing, uh, the distribution is normalized at each position, okay? Each position we have a distribution, while the CRFs are not that, okay? So uh, the local loss assumes that, assumes these things, that a certain label, uh, the distribution it uses the Markov assumption. The distribution of a label given the previous is equal to the distribution of a label given just the, 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 the previous one. So in this case, um, you know, we are assuming more. So any type of local loss is also a global one. So whenever we are training a local loss, we're actually restricting more, okay? We're, we're looking for distributions that are more restricted. There are more, many distributions that 
are global but are not local. Okay, so we are using a loss that is more restrictive. So this leads to a problem that was called the labels bias problem. This was introduced in the first paper on CRF and has a justification of or a description of what this is. This was later developed more recently. It was a paper, very interesting paper that I, re I really recommend uh, you to read, okay? Because this paper is using uh, neural nets, is using beam search, and it's showing that the fact that, and it's, it's uh, the representation, mm, it uses the representation over all the, uh, all the action sequences. So the representation is very expressive. This paper shows that the label bias problem applies even for models that are highly, highly expressive and that condition on the full sequence. Actually, it shows that the label bias problem uh, applies even if you don't use the Markov assumption, right? The, the label bias problem is related to trying to predict what comes next and being obsessed with that, like I want to predict the next thing correctly, while there are cases where you can make a mistake locally, but globally still the things will cor uh, work correctly, right? So that's somehow the label bias problem. Um, so in essence, this is, um, this is the situation. This is, um, let's say that this is a, uh, kind of an advanced concept, okay? So my, my lecture today was more of like, let's introduce the main elements. So what I would recommend is that, um, you know, you get familiar with the different models, with the different loss functions, and then read again these papers and read them again and read them again, okay? And then at the end, you'll get a sense of what's the difference between a factored and a non-factored model when it comes to predicting or defining a loss, et cetera, et cetera, okay? All right, so to wrap up, um, I presented linear models for sequence prediction. Uh, I insisted a lot of the advantages that the computations factorize on bigrams, okay? Because then this allows you to use Viterbi or forward-backward. Um, and then parameter estimation will all, again, it can be based on perceptron, on log likelihood, namely CRFs. There's also variations of SVMs for the structure case, which I didn't cover, okay? Uh, in all cases, these are extensions of these algorithms from classification to the structure case where the type of loss functions doesn't even change. What changes is like, oh, this algorithm is asking me for this computation, in particular perceptron asks for arc max, while log likelihood asks for marginals. So we need to, for our model, we need to be able to provide these routines, okay? Once you have that, essentially, so one thing is defining the loss function and the model. There is to, actual, to actually train the model. So for that, we use general purpose optimization methods like a, st a stochastic gradient descent. Uh, there's other variations, exponentiated gradient. So all these methods apply well to any form of uh, structure prediction problem. And essentially, this, this is it for, for the learning part. Um, if I have five minutes, I can go, I can do a quick, a quick thing. It's not going to be five, it's going to be ten, but, um, okay. But is there any question? Maybe I could take questions on the learning uh, thing. Okay, maybe at the end. So, okay, so dependency parsing. Um, so instead of here, what is dependency parsing? Dependency parsing is, is associating uh, uh, a sentence with a tree that encodes what are the syntactic uh, components and relations in, in the sentence, okay? That's syntax in general, but when we are using dependencies, the way we represent syntax is in the form of these arcs, okay, which are called dependencies, right? So the way this works, we assume that there is a root word that uh, is somewhere and that points to the main word of the sentence, which is typically the verb, okay, solved. And then you can ask uh, who solved to what? And then you go to the subject and you get they solved it. And what did they solve? You go to the direct object and you see the problem. And how did it solve it? With statistics, okay? And each, uh, so by, you know, it gives you a representation of what are components 
there's this part, there's this part, there's this part, and how do they relate with each other, okay? And uh, dependencies are always these binary arcs between any two words, okay? And the thing needs to be a tree. So why is this useful? So because you can have these ambiguous sentences and there's a, an alternative reading of the sentence that, so one thing is to say that uh, there is a problem and by using statistical methods I solve it, and another thing is like I have a problem of statistical nature and then I work it out and I solve it, okay? It's a problem, I'm you know, uh, studying statistics and I have this problem, right? So uh, the different readings g get represented with dependency trees, okay? Dependency trees, so in the first uh, one with the statistics is something that modifies the way I'm solving something. Um, in the second one with statistics is something that modifies the problem, okay? So it's different, right? So if you want to compute meaning and stuff, so it's good to have dependency trees because meaning probably is much better to compute it on top of this rather than on plain sentences. Okay, anyhow, uh, I'm skipping this. So uh, the thing is that there's two types of models that are very popular in dependency parsing. One is the factored one, okay? Factored means I'm taking structures and I'm enumerating the different parts, okay? so. In a dependency tree, what is natural is to consider that each dependency or arc is a part. So I'm going to call these arc factor models because they look at the tree. So the parsing problem is of all possible trees, give me the tree that maximizes the sum of scores of the dependencies. Okay, so I have a model, a linear one or a nonlinear model one that scores dependencies. Uh, and I'm going to score each dependency in independently of each other and then uh, it, it turns out to be that there's tractable inference, okay? So these are some examples of features that I can, so actually Ryan was, uh, Ryan McDonald was one of the first uh, people to, to bring this uh, arc factor type of models trained with perceptron and other algorithms into the literature, and he made very relevant work in, in 2005. And so here's features, I don't want to go into detail, then there's two types of algorithms to that with an arc factor model you can use. One is based on maximum spanning trees, okay? You represent all the possible dependencies as scored somehow, and then uh, by running this you get a tree, okay? So this is the this is the role of Viterbi, right? So in sequence we use Viterbi, in trees we use this kind of algorithms, but it's the same role. Like if I have a factored model and I have a scores, how do I get the best tree? Okay, so I, you, I run this. And this is structural in quadratic time. There is another algorithm by developed by Jason Eisner in 96 that has been very, very uh, successful also. It's a variation of CKY for, for context-free grammars. And it's cubic time, but the main advantage of, of this one is that it allows you to, to make extensions uh, of increasing the order of the factorization. So instead of just uh, scoring each dependency, dependency alone, you can consider pairs of dependencies in different ways, in a vertical or horizontal way. So this is getting into the, into the substance of parsing, but it's this notion that if your, if your factors are too small, meaning that there's information that should be captured, but it's not, maybe you can increase the factors and have better features. So as long as you can parse, you can ask, produce the, the best tree with those features, everything is good and the framework works, okay? And so while, while these kind of algorithms cannot be extended to larger chunks, this can, okay? This can, uh, even though the constants are sometimes prohibitive, but there's engineering you can do, and this showed, uh, this happened to be very successful. Uh, these are curves, so the red curve is a first order model, the blue curve is a higher order one with larger chunks with different training sizes, okay, so, and then this is a better representation of features, so, you know, uh, by adding things, things get better, so the results uh, are good. There's another, so these are factor models for parsing, there's another approach which is transition-based, like, there's a, s there's a number of operations that let you build a tree incrementally, okay, so you apply a transition system, uh, and one of the most uh, successful ones for dependency parsing are ARC standard uh, systems by Joachim Nibre. So it has uh, three actions. So the, let me give you the example of how thi these things work, okay? So maybe your sentence is uh, this one, we want to guess the parse trees, so this is the target, okay? 
So the transition system, the state, the configuration works with a buffer and a stack. And the buffer has the words that we need to process, the sentence, and the stack has what the structure that we already built, okay? So we start applying, the shift operation moves words from a buffer to a stack, and then uh, whenever, so the, 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 the tree is built within the stack. So the, that, that's operations to move words from here to the stack, and then there's operations to connect the words between the stack, okay? This puts a left arc, and then uh, we're, we're gonna shift more words, and we're gonna put another left arc, and we're gonna shift more words, and, whoops, and we're gonna put a right arc. So the point is being that with some operations, I can, you know, have all the sentences in the buffer and then put them in the stack and keep building the tree incrementally. The point being that at any point here, at any point you need to choose which of the operations you need to do. So it's a transition system that needs to greedily uh, choose what is the best action to, to build the tree, right? So this, there's, n there's no way you can write this as a factor model. This, this type of uh, operations are not factored at all. Okay, so there's no way you can make exact predictions like that, so you live up with, with greedy search. Uh, but this has been very successful, okay? Um, so the type of representations under a transition-based model are very rich because you have, you have the words in the stack and the buffer, you have partial subtrees, you have the sequence of actions. So uh, especially I think that with neural nets, um, the type of models you get here are very effective because neural nets are very effective at encoding this type of different parts of a problem, right? You, you, you are parsing and you have all these different uh, substructures. You need to encode to decide what to do next. Uh, since neural networks were introduced, there's been a huge gain of, of this kind of methods. While before they were clearly below factor models, now they are even the same or sometimes better, right? Why? Because maybe uh, the feature templates we were using before were too limited. And now neural net find a way to represent the good information that is somehow there. So even if, if it's greedy, if the predictor of what come the next action is very good, the, you, the greedy uh, approach will be less problematic, right? A greedy prediction cannot be beaten if every single step is correct, right? If you, so if you have the perfect prediction of an option, you cannot beat, it's, it's very fast. Uh, so that's why it's very, I think it's very, it's very rich to have in the literature all these kind of models, right? W ones that are fast but uh, are greedy, but they're very, very expressive. Others that have all these properties and you can, uh, you know, define distributions and compute marginals and that you cannot do with greedy models, okay? Uh, so in summary, for the lecture, so maybe yesterday you saw multi-class classification, whoa which is a linear model that chooses one of the many values. So today I tried to argue that even if you are doing sequence prediction or dependency parsing, the same style of uh, approach works, only that if we want things that to be tractable, we need to make some assumptions on how do we represent x and y, okay? So a good, um, a good approach is this factored representations because in many cases for many factorizations they allow for quick solving of these problems while being expressive okay but you know we also have uh, transition systems that are very fast expressive but they can be such errors now just to close um, a couple of remarks about nonlinearities okay so you might think that all that I explained was uh, relative for linear models, and actually that's that's not the case. It's not, um, so most stuff I was doing, we were talking about a scoring um, structures by a scoring its factor factors. And I chose that the scoring of a factor is linear. That's most of my lecture, I concentrated on that. 
but uh, you can also put a nonlinear function in here. Okay, so if you have a, you need to do a score, you can, uh, you can, uh, kind of start with some representation and do some hidden uh, representation of that, and somehow uh, you know learn representations. H is learn. H is the result of running this through a, a, a number of layers, right? Then there's this. Uh, problem with the notation when we use linear learning we put the output in the Im in the feature vector here you cannot do that that easily so this is uh, this expression is is a bit uh, you know that there's this notation but what it means is that you that nothing prevents you to 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 learn uh, the r the f the representation by which your parameters will operate at the end there's uh, at the top of the of the of the deep layer of the deep uh, network. There's always some final uh, layer that gives you the final scores. Okay, so when I'm saying I'm scoring a stru a structures by the scores in each part, that is compatible with nonlinear models because we can still uh, uh, take this approach, but compute the scores for each bigram in a nonlinear fashion, right? So if you do that, it's still a factor model that is nonlinear, okay? So you still get the benefits of Viterbi and forward-backward, okay? But uh, parameter estimation becomes not convex, okay? Yeah, so you use backpropagation instead of the other, uh, the other uh, algorithms. Okay, the ultimate um, ideal is to, is to learn representations Okay, from the we have the input, we have the output, and things are not connected with each other. I'm not using bigrams here, and I'm not using, um, I'm not considering pairs of, of label, output labels, and I'm not considering features that look at combinations of the inputs at the time. What I'm hoping is that there is a representation in the middle that abstracts away, right? So any relevant information here can go here, and then this is connected, and maybe. Uh, some information here will travel here and it will impact this or this, right? And uh, maybe this will travel here and it will impact this, right? So this is the ultimate ideal to have a hidden representation that is in the middle of the input and the output, but that is uh, both the predictions are non-tractable, but in any case, uh, for many successful models, the predictions are not tractable either and learning is non-convex, so what, okay? So the current trend is, okay, before we were caring about tractability and convexity in learning, and I think that maybe we got to a point that things were saturated, we were doing crazy stuff like increasing the order of factor models in a way that is very impractical also, and now things are going to the non-convexity, right? But still, if you check the recent papers on neural networks uh, for, say, an M entity recollection, after all the layer, there's a CRF layer, okay? So that's what I explained today, right? So uh, this CRF layer somehow uses a CRF loss, and maybe there's some things that are different, but it's essentially a factor model where the input representations are encoded, okay, with neural networks, and that's what's, what Barbara is gonna cover tomorrow, okay? And uh, that's another paper on sequence labeling, and there's also a CRF on the top, okay? And then they see that the models that use CRFs are better in the test than those that don't, right? So, which means that this ideal, we're still far, right? We still, we cannot make the best successful models without explicitly connecting parts of the input and parts of the output. Like when you see a CRF loss, it means that the output bits are somehow connected and their parameters looking explicitly at that, right? Whether you model that linearly or non-linearly is different, but the fact that you need to, you cannot break, you need to break the structure into something smaller, that's always the case in any problem, okay? So that's essentially my lecture. I thank you very much. I hope I wasn't uh, too long or too tedious. I hope you learn, and thank you very much.